Good morning. My name is Charlotte Hurd. I am the staff member responsible for coordinating the Academy nominations for U.S. Senator Mark Warner. The COVID-19 pandemic necessitated making our Academy Day 2021 event virtual. Senator Warner wanted to ensure that everyone had a way to get the important information that our presenters will share, and we hope that this virtual event will be a good resource for you. Please join me in welcoming the University of Virginia Air Force ROTC Ensemble Singers, Cadet Anna Linehan and Cadet Aliana Kyle, who will sing the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof Thank you, Cadet Linehan and Cadet Kyle. Now let's welcome Senator Warner for his opening remarks. Hi, I'm Virginia Senator Mark Warner, and I want to welcome you to our Academy Day. I wish I'd be greeting you in person. I know we have to do this again virtually this year, uh, but I commend all of the students and parents who are, who are attending, at least virtually, uh, this important step in your son or daughter's education, and hopefully, future service to our country. We all know during COVID, we've all been tested in ways that uh, we probably couldn't have imagined over a year ago. Uh, during that time as well, we've seen our nation tested as our adversaries around the world continue to press on us, whether it be through military, economic, social media, cyber, or a whole host of other, of other means. It's why we need such good young people to continue to be willing to apply and attend our great service academies. I'm proud of the fact that uh, every year we get over 600 applications to our service academies. It's a very competitive process, uh, but many of your sons and daughters I know will meet the grade, and I am very thankful that we've put together a thorough review process, and I want to particularly thank uh, all the representatives uh, who will speak about the academies and who help us go through the vetting process. I want to encourage the um, parents to uh, have their sons and daughters apply through this process. And I want to thank particularly the young people who are thinking about um, getting this world-class education in a way that also will provide service to protect our nation going forward. Um, for those of you who go through this process, we then, uh, once you are awarded, uh, we bring you to Washington before you head off to your academies. And it's um, one of the days that I value the most, seeing the next generation of our military and our country's leadership uh, who attend our, our great service academies. So thanks so much. I can tell you we work well with Senator Kane and the whole congressional delegation to make sure that we can make this uh, process as seamless as possible. Uh, I know many of you will, will serve, whether you go to academies or not, but will serve our country uh, in many ways going forward. Again, thanks for attending this virtual Academy Day. Thank you, Senator Warner. I will now talk about service academy nominations. Virginia is a competitive state with many qualified applicants. Last year, Senator Warner received almost 600 applications. The Senator's goal is to see that as many qualified applicants receive a nomination as possible. Each member of Congress can nominate 10 applicants each year to each academy. In years that have two vacancies, they can nominate 20 applicants 
which is truly a bonus for Virginia. Of those 10 applicants, only one is guaranteeing an offer as long as the applicant is qualified. This does not mean that other offers cannot be made. Virginia has so many top-notch applicants that many times more than one applicant on the list receives an offer. As of today, Senator Warner, seven nominees have received West Point offers, five have received U.S. Merchant Marine Academy offers, three have received Air Force Academy offers, and one has received a Naval Academy offer. Applying to a service academy is a two-tiered process. The first tier is the actual application to the academy. The second tier is a nomination, which is required for four out of the five service academies. A nomination is not required for the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. A nomination is not an offer or an appointment, but is an endorsement of a candidate from an official nominating source. An appointment is an offer from the service academy for a candidate who is found to be fully qualified academically, medically, physically, and has obtained a nomination from a nominating source. Fully qualified means you can compete for an appointment. Although applicants will soon be able to start the nomination process, it is also recommended to open a file at the service academies. This is normally done the spring of your junior year. The service academy application will be required to be open before submitting your completed application for a service academy nomination. There are several sources available for a nomination. To optimize the chances of receiving a nomination to an academy, applicants are encouraged to apply to their congressmen, both Virginia senators, Senators Warner and Kane, and the vice president. It is important to note that Virginia senators and congressmen and women do not make their nominations based on who claims to have voted for them, volunteered for them, or donated money. These are not political nominations. Some applicants may also qualify for a presidential nomination. These applicants are the sons and daughters of active duty, retired and reserve military. The application for the presidential nomination can be obtained on a respective academy's website. Please note, the Merchant Marine Academy does not use presidential or vice presidential nominations. Other nomination sources include ROTC, regular and reserve enlisted personnel, children of Medal of Honor awardees, and children of POW MIA deceased or disabled veterans. Information for these nomination sources can be found on the Service Academy websites as well. It is important to apply to all nomination sources that you qualify for. Approximately three quarters of the academy classes are filled with congressional nominations and a quarter of the class is filled with presidential nominations and other nomination sources. The first step for applying for a nomination from Senator Warner is to establish your online application. The application will be available starting Monday, April 27, 2021 at the Senator's website, www.warner.senate.gov under Service Academies. The application will close on Friday, September 24th, 2021 at 5 p.m. Applicants are encouraged to read each line carefully as instructions for each required document is provided within the application. If applying for other nomination sources, applicants should also make note that the processes and deadlines may be different. The last part of Senator Warner's Service Academy nomination process is an interview. All applicants will be notified if they are selected or not selected to receive an interview. Interviews will be conducted virtually and will take place between the middle of October and the beginning of December. Interviews are conducted by Senator Warner's Service Academy Review Board, who are all alumni from the respective academies. The board is looking at the whole person which is exactly what the academies are looking for. The whole person consists of leadership, character, scholarship, motivation, physical aptitude, and medical fitness. The review board ranks all interviewed applicants and submits their recommendations for nominations to Senator Warner. This keeps the process transparent and away from politics. 
Sometimes an applicant is interested in applying to more than one service academy. Because we receive so many applications, Senator Warner will only consider you for your first choice. Some members of Congress who have fewer applicants may be willing to nominate an applicant for their second, third, or fourth choice for a service academy. Once Senator Warner has decided which applicants will receive a nomination, the nominations will be provided to each of the service academies, and then the nominee will be notified. This will be done prior to January 31st of each year. When submitting these nominations, Senator Warner uses the competitive method. This means he nominates his 10 applicants, but does not prioritize. We're very fortunate in that Virginia delegation is interested in nominating the best qualified applicants. Because Virginia has so many qualified applicants, Senator Warner and Senator Kane have agreed to minimize double nominating an applicant. We also confer with the other congressional offices. However, it is possible that an applicant could receive more than one nomination. If an applicant applies to an academy, but doesn't receive an offer, the applicant may receive an offer to a prep school or receive a foundation scholarship. These are determined by the individual service academies and are not opportunities that the applicant applies for or that the congressional offices have input to. We realize that this process can be overwhelming. On Senator Warner's website, we have made available lots of information, including links to each of the military service academies. Additionally, please, please review our website on a recurring basis for additional information that may be provided over the course of the nomination process. If you have additional questions, please feel free to email academy underscore noms at warner.senate.gov. I want to take this time to thank all of the presenters who have made time to join us today. First, we'll hear from Virginia Congressional Delegation staff about their office's service academy nomination processes. Please join me in welcoming Taylor Thornhill, representing Senator Tim Kaine. Greetings, everyone. Um, thank you so much to Charlotte and Senator Warner's office for inviting us here today. Um, very quickly, I just want to go over our office's Academy nominations process. So our online applications will open for the Academy classes of 2026 on May 3rd, 2021 at www.cane.senate.gov dash Academy dash nominations. Um, our deadline for our applications will be on October 8th, 2021, um, as, as well as the online application, we require materials such as official transcripts, SAT or ACT scores, and two letters of recommendations. Um, and we understand that SAT and ACT tests might be hard to take right now due to COVID-19, and we will work with you on that. Applicants must also begin the application process with the academy of their choice as well. Senator Kane's review committee will evaluate each applicant and provide recommendations to the senator. Uh, with our academy nominations process, applicants are not interviewed um, during the process. So just keep that in mind as well. All applicants will receive a decision letter in January 2022. Applicants chosen to receive an academy nomination must then compete for an appointment from the service academy directly. Um, if anyone has any questions um, about our process or has any concerns, please do not um, hesitate to reach out to our academy nominations coordinator at 804-771-2221 or academy underscore nominations at cane.senate.gov. Thank you so much for your time again, you all, um, and good luck to all the applicants. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thornhill. From the second congressional district, representing Congresswoman Elaine Luria, let's welcome Dr. Charles Stupard. Good morning. My name is Dr. Charles Stupard, and I'm also a retired U.S. Navy captain. It is my pleasure to represent Congresswoman Luria of Virginia's second congressional district. Our application requirements, website and point of contact are listed here. You will apply through our website. We are looking for an exceptional academic record 
and standardized test scores. We would like to see a commitment to a few sports, clubs, and organizations rather than many different activities only for one year or one season each. When we see commitment to these things, we see someone who would devote themselves to a career of service. We are looking for applicants who are selfless, dedicated, and well-balanced individuals. You illustrate your leadership capabilities through your resume, your essay, and your choice of who provides letters of recommendation. Our application portal will open on June 1st, and all applications are due in our office no later than 5 p.m. on Friday, October 1st. There will be no exceptions, and we will consider only complete packages. You can apply for a nomination to one or more service academies. We would like for you to prioritize your preferences on your application. The more academies you show interest in, the more opportunities you will have for appointment. Please remember, you must apply to the actual academies as well. For the candidates selected from the application, our selection board will hold interviews in November. In mid-December, we will notify all candidates of our nomination decisions. Please reach out if you have any questions to Mrs. Tara Johnson, who is our service academy coordinator. Stay healthy and safe and we look forward to receiving your nomination packages. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stepar. From the third congressional district representing Congressman Bobby Scott, let's welcome Demontre Boone. Thank you. I'd like to thank Senator Warner's office and his staff for putting today's event together. So I'll quickly go over a few important dates for Congressman Scott's process. The 2026 cycle will begin for us on Tuesday, June 1st. And the application will be available to print on Congressman Scott's website on that date. A breakdown of the items to submit in a candidate packet are listed on Congressman Scott's Academy page on his website. And the website address is Bobby Scott dot house dot gov. Every candidate who submits a packet by the deadline will be interviewed. The deadline to drop off a packet by the district office, which is located in Newport News, is Friday, October 29th by 5 p.m. The last day to mail a packet to our office is also October 29th and the packet needs to be postmarked with that date. The projected start date for interviews to begin is Monday, November 1st. Interviews are generally held on weekday evenings between 5.45 p.m. and 8 p.m. At this time, it is unclear if interviews will be held in person in the district office or over Zoom. That decision will be made in the fall, so please give me a call at 757-380-1000 around October 15th if you have any questions. We hope to have interviews completed in early December and candidates will be notified of Congressman Scott's decision by mail in the second half of December. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, Mr. Boone. From the 4th Congressional District representing Congressman Donald McEachin, let's welcome Scott Bilal. Hello and welcome. As you can see from our slide, we will be start accepting applications on the 1st of June and they will end on the 1st of October. After applications have been received, they will be reviewed to ensure that they meet the packet requirements from our website. At that time, you'll be scheduled for a digital interview when all the interviews are completed and evaluated, you will be notified of your results according to the timeline on our, on our slide. I have included the website on the slide as well as the mailing addresses for your packets to send in. Please note that it is important to send in a complete packet as incomplete packets will delay the processing to get you an interview. 
In addition, ensure that you rank all of your service academy preference, preferences as this is a highly competitive process. If you are having any issues regarding your SAT or ACT scores, please reach out to the office at 757-942-6050 and we'll get back with you and work with you on that. And again, on behalf of the Congressman, thank you and good luck on your journey. Thank you, Mr. Bilal. From the 8th Congressional District, representing Congressman Don Beyer, let's welcome Noah Simon. Hello, everybody, and thank you to Senator Warner's office for organizing this. I do want to congratulate the interested applicants. There are many ways to serve your country, and this is a very important one. Our process will mirror very much what happened this year. Um, our application process opens August 1st, and it closes on Oct uh, October 8th. Our packets, our letters, everything will again be done via email. Uh, we too do not know whether our interviews will be in person or not. Something that differentiates us a little bit from others is for every uh, Service Academy application, there is an interview that's required. For example, if an applicant applies to West Point, to the Air Force Academy and the Naval Academy, there'll be three separate interviews with three separate boards. Happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, my email address is on the slide, noah.simon at mail.house.gov. Thank you for your interest and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Simon. From the 9th Congressional District, representing Congressman Morgan Griffith, let's welcome Mr. John Bever. Thank you. And on behalf of the Congressman and um, and on behalf of myself, uh, I want to thank Senator Warner's office uh, for affording us this opportunity. And um, we also want to thank the potential applicants for their interest in attending a service academy and uh, their interest in serving our great nation. Um, just a couple quick dates. Uh, we have an October 15th deadline. So October 15th, by close of business, uh, we require a um, complete package to be uh, delivered. It can be hand-delivered, mail, however, but that needs to be delivered in person to our office. Um, that package um, will consist of a current photo, high school transcripts, uh, ACT, SAT scores, uh, a resume, and a 500-word essay, and also three recommendation letters sealed and signed across the seal. Um, so we have the October 15th deadline. Um, after that, uh, we'll schedule interviews for each of our applicants. Uh, those typically take place in November. And then our notifications from the congressman will go out uh, by about mid-January. Um, for more information, uh, you can go to morgangriffith.house.gov. And if you hover over the serving you uh, menu, scroll down to Military Service Academy nominations. Um, and click that. You'll find uh, our FAQs there, a link to those. Um, I encourage you all to read those thoroughly. Um, any questions that you have uh, can typically be answered there. You'll also find a link to our application package there. Um, and that comes with a checklist. So um, if you run into a situation where you have any other questions that you, you can't find the answers to, or if you just want to talk about the process and what all it consists of, feel free to contact me at 276-525-1405. You can also reach me via email at john, J-O-H-N dot Bebber, B-E-B-B-E-R at mail.house.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bebber. From the 10th Congressional District representing Congresswoman Jennifer Wexton, Let's welcome Anthony Barnes. Thank you, Charlotte. And thank you to uh, Senator Warner for having us uh, this afternoon. On behalf of the Congresswoman, I, I uh, want to applaud you for your interest in serving your country in this fashion. And I uh, want to go over just a few quick dates and, and a few quick differences here with our um, academy process. So as you can see on the screen here, applications for our office open on May 1st. They will be available on our website, wexton.house.gov. Similarly, under services and academy nominations, you'll be able to find the application along with frequently asked questions. Our application deadline is 
October 1st, 2021. Very strict deadline. Um, all completed applications uh, must be submitted by then. Um, we are still determining the best method for uh, submission. Typically, it would be either in person or via uh, mail. Last year, we did do via email, so we may continue that this year. Um, stay tuned for, for those details. Um, we do have an Academy Day of our own scheduled on April 17th, where you'll be able to hear from our Service Academy Advisory Board in more detail, specifically what we're looking for uh, within the district. Um, if you have any questions at all, uh, my contact information is here on the slide. I can be reached directly at that number or via email. So again, thank you so much for having us and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. From the 11th Congressional District representing Congressman Gerald Connolly, let's welcome Julian Bricky. Hello, everybody. Um, and uh, I wanna say thank you to uh, Senator Warner for having us here to participate in this. Um, uh, so a little, a few differences in our office. Um, our application process is currently open. All submissions will be due by Friday, October 1st at 5 p.m. Um, that is not flexible at this time. Uh, we do suggest getting those applications in as soon as possible, just in case there are any issues that we need to correct. Um, after October 1st, we'll coordinate it with the applicants uh, to schedule interviews. Uh, this is done on a first come, first serve basis. Um, everyone who completes an application will get an interview. Um, our district is highly competitive. Uh, so, you know, we definitely suggest highlighting areas that will separate you from the rest of applicants to have the best chance. We definitely look forward to working with all the students who are going down this path. Um, as a veteran myself uh, and on behalf of the whole office, we appreciate your interest in serving your nation. If you have any questions, please give us a call at 703-256-3071. Or you can visit us uh, or you can reach out to us at uh, connolly.house.gov. Again, thank you very much and everyone have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Bricky. If you didn't hear from your representative's office, know that you can and should go to your congressional representative's website for information regarding their application process. Each congressional office has their own procedures and deadlines for their nominations. Not everyone will receive an offer to a service academy, and many may decide that they don't want to attend an academy. Virginia has some other wonderful options to consider that we'll now hear about. First, let's welcome Captain Mary Shriver. She is the Assistant Director of Admissions for the Virginia Military Institute. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mary Shriver of VMI class of 2014, and I work on the admissions staff here at VMI. So VMI is located in Lexington, Virginia, and is the oldest state-supported military college in the U.S. The VMI experience combines the daily life and structure of a federal service academy with the well-rounded academics of a small liberal arts college and the military commissioning options of an ROTC program. VMI offers Army, Air Force, Space Force, Navy, and Marine ROTC programs, and we have a direct commission option into the Coast Guard as well. VMI is unique among all military colleges and ROTC programs because every student is in the Corps of Cadets and must participate in ROTC. So there are no civilian students here on post, even though commissioning into the military is optional at VMI. Another unique quality of the VMI experience is the exposure that cadets receive to all branches of service and not just the particular branch that they participate in. The combination of the daily military structure of the Corps of Cadets and the ROTC instruction provides a top tier military training experience, which is evident by the success of VMI graduates. VMI is the only military college to graduate the highest ranking four-star generals across three service branches, including both an Army and Air Force Chief of Staff and two military and two Marine Corps, uh, Marine Corps Commandants, excuse me. Though VMI's experience 
is comparable to a service academy, the admissions process is most similar to a civilian college because you do not need a congressional nomination to apply or to be accepted to VMI. And the process will begin in the fall of your senior year as well. So we hope you will consider VMI as an option for your college experience and a means to commission into one of the service branches. Please feel free to reach out to myself or another member of the admission staff if you have any questions or would like any more information about VMI. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Shriver. Now let's welcome Lieutenant Colonel Rira Mariger. She is the Assistant Commandant of Cadets for Recruiting for the Virginia Tech Corps of Cadets. Hello, so thank you very much. Um, well, you've heard from VMI, there's another senior military college here in Virginia, and that's the Virginia Tech Corps of Cadets. So we are core within the larger public university of Virginia Tech. So all of our cadets are um, part of the core and they live in our residence halls while they're here, but they're also um, a certain portion of them are in ROTC. So something that makes us a little bit different is that we have Army, Naval and Air Force but um, we also have a citizen leader track and that's for students who maybe aren't interested or are not medically qualified to commission. They choose to go to our citizen leader track and 83% of our citizen leader tracks had a job or grad school offer six months prior to graduation. This really paid off in the year of COVID when our grads had their jobs nailed down in December before COVID hit. And so this is a goal for our citizen leader track. So if the service academies don't work out or if you're struggling to get Dobmer qualified, um, know that there's also another option and it's a great way to learn about leadership and learn how to serve. So of all the options you have in college, I think the lifestyle kind of fits along a continuum, right? On one end of the spectrum, you have the civilian university or that ROTC only program. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the all military, all the time schools, right? A lot of our sister senior military colleges fit there as well as the service academy. Right in the middle, you've got Virginia Tech and Texas A&M. And we're the only two that have a core within a larger public university. So it makes us kind of unique in the options that are out there for you. I would say we have three major um, differences from being at a civilian or ROTC only program. The first is we're gonna give you a lot more academic transition between high school and college. You know, students coming in are averaging about a 4.17 GPA in high school, even though that doesn't really mean anything. It's apples, oranges, and bananas all got mushed together. But to me, it says, wow, these students are academically prepared to be in college. Um, a year later, the average GPA at the university is a 2.92. They're averaging Cs, you know? And why? We think it comes down to time management. Major difference in the core, our cadets averaged a 3.27 last year. Um, just a, you know, a little bit better than that 292. We're gonna help you make that transition from high school to college a little bit more successful. Also, we're gonna give you a very different roommate experience, right? We're gonna take things out of the room that cause conflict between roommates. You know, we're gonna take TV out for a while. We take music out for a while. We're just gonna give you an opportunity to learn how to communicate first before we start adding in all these things that can cause conflict. And then we set some rules. So then it's not if, um, if the trash should go, to, go out, it's, is it your turn or is it my turn? Because the course says it has to be out by eight. It's just a very different starting point. So we're gonna give you, um, we're gonna give you a roommate that's on the same team as you instead of in conflict with you. And last but not least, it's about leadership opportunities. As a senior military college, we have 12, we had 1,187 cadets last year. We hope to break about 1,200 this year. So what does that mean? We have over 100 leadership positions every semester that lead at least 30 people or more. Now, why do we set the bar at 30? Because that's what a brand new second lieutenant or ensign should expect. So shift to Virginia Tech. We have three of the largest, and of course, in my opinion, three of the best ROTCs in the nation. Come seek out the exact same leadership opportunities you can find at any of the other ROTC programs right here in our ROTC program. But in addition, we have the Corps of Cadets. And like I said, with over 1,100 cadets, we have over 90 positions every semester that lead at least 30 people or more. Our company commanders lead 90, our battalion commanders lead 330, our regimental commanders responsible for over 1,100 cadets. So you're gonna get a lot more academic transition between high school and college. 
you'll have a very different roommate experience and you have a lot more leadership opportunities, I think, at Virginia Tech and a senior military college than you would at a civilian or ROTC only program. Of course, the service academies and our sister senior military colleges, they get this. They're gonna do these same kinds of things. So what I see on that end is this, freshman year, it's all about transitioning from high school to college. Sophomore year, whoa, my grades, I gotta get my grades back, right? They're very academics focused. Our juniors though, they're coming back to college, they're starting to feel pretty confident about academics and leadership and they go, wait a minute, college is almost over. I don't wanna give up on my college experience. You know, you pop your head up, look around all military all the time school, it is still all military all the time. You know, you do that here, we have over 800 different student organizations you can belong to. You know, you wanna jump out of a perfectly good airplane, we have a skydiving club. You wanna play, you, you know, you wanna watch squirrels or drink hot chocolate, <laughs> there's a club for it here on campus. So I think that the truth is that it's, you can earn a commission from any of these sources. So what it really comes down to is what do you want your college experience to look like? And what do you want those leadership opportunities to look like? And we want you to know there's an option right here in the middle and that's the Virginia Tech Corps of Cadets. I wish you the best of luck in your process. Thank you, Colonel Mariger. Next we have Brigadier General Terry DeJuric. She is with the Virginia's Women's Institute for Leadership, Commandant of the Cadets at Mary Baldwin University. Thanks, Charlotte. And thanks to all our high school students that are watching us today. I really wanna thank you for your willingness to serve our nation in the armed forces and to the parents and grandparents that helped them get to this, to watch this video. I wanna thank you also for your support of your student because these are difficult processes um, and choices that they have because they are all top performing students. Uh, I'm the Commandant of Cadets at the Virginia Women's Institute for Leadership and I'm pleased to join the military academies and our senior military colleges because Virginia has so much to offer from a university perspective. Um, Mary Baldwin University hosts a military college experience as well. It is uh, the only one of its kind in the nation. It focuses on women's leadership development. Mary Baldwin University is 180 years old in the fall and, um, and it's a co-ed, it's a small private not-for-profit university. That university within itself has a women's college, and that's where this Virginia Women's Institute for Leadership is housed, and I'm, I'm pleased to be that commandant. We're in Stanton, Virginia. If you look closely at the pictures, you can see it's a beautiful campus all year round in all seasons. It's in the Shenandoah Valley, um, just a, about 30 minutes from Harrisonburg and 30 minutes from Charlottesville and uh, Lexington as well. So it's a great location. I think what I wanna share with you is if you look closely in each one of these pictures, you might see yourself within our core of cadets. We have a very diverse, um, based on minority and race et ethnicity, we're at about 58%. Sometimes we're up to 77%, a much different look than what you'd see at many other uh, military college opportunities. I say that because I want people to see themselves as future leaders and see those opportunities they can have. Our commissioning rates, we partner with VMI and the ROTC units at VMI. So we are a crosstown opportunity and you'll hear from Colonel Ho at, down at, uh, at, Virginia, at UVA more about ROTC opportunities, but think about that. About a hundred person, 125 person core of cadets traveling to VMI, we provide all that transportation and that support system between myself daily with those cadets. And that's why I took on this responsibility so that daily eye to eye, I could talk to those cadets, help them choose whatever they, they want to do. With the same regards, you can, you can have the opportunity to commission in all of the armed forces. The one difference is uh, with the Coast Guard, because of our high diversity rate, uh, since I've been here for eight years, our cadets have the opportunity to compete and three have uh, been successful in a two-year Coast Guard scholarship. And that's afforded to us basically because of our high diversity rate. 
NCAA Division III, about 35% of our cadets participate in, in each of the sports there. Um, it's a great opportunity. I love every day uh, coming to work here, and I love the partnership that we have with VMI, ROTC, and we combine both military and civilian leadership opportunities. And, uh, and, I, and I used what, what Virginia Tech told you. I work closely with them on each of the ideas they come up with because it works great with that citizen leader opportunity. And many of our cadets continue in this four-year leadership program because they believe in it. So again, great opportunities across the state of Virginia. Thankful for Senator Warner for putting this together each year. And I wish each one of you an opportunity to go to college, get the degree you want. And if commissioning is an opportunity that you wanna seek, go for it. Thank you. Thank you, General DeJuric. Now let's welcome Colonel Mike Huff. He is the commander of the Air Force ROTC Detachment 890. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Um, as uh, General DeJuric mentioned that, uh, yes, indeed, uh, I'm the commander of the of, uh, Air Force ROTC Detachment 890. And I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and I'm gonna talk specifically about uh, commissioning into the US Air Force uh, or the United States Space Force. So we are located at the University of Virginia. The detachment is located here. And again, as General DeJerk mentioned, uh, we do have crosstown. So underneath the Detachment 890 umbrella, uh, again, not only is it University of Virginia, but we also have cadets from Liberty University, James Madison University, and uh, from Piedmont Virginia Community College, which is here in Charlottesville. Um, we would love to have you come up and visit the detachment one time uh, if you'd like to take a look. Uh, I encourage you to go to our website that's listed there, uh, afrotc.virginia.edu. Uh, so there are um, a number of scholarship opportunities and types of scholarship that you could get uh, if you would like to um, go the Air Force ROTC route. Um, there are, is um, the High School Scholarship Program, or HSSP, and uh, that window opens up for application. It opens up uh, in July and goes through December of this year. And you can see the qualifications in order to be eligible for that uh, scholarship. You must have uh, a 1240 SAT or 26 on the ACT and maintain a 3.0 GPA or higher. Uh, and if you uh, go through the application process, you will interview with a detachment um, officer and, um, and they will submit the results of that application off to a scholarship board and uh, hopefully that you will get a notification that you are, are in receipt of a high school um, scholarship. And so that's one of the ways to enter the uh, Air Force ROTC program. Another is you can join ROTC without a scholarship and, and can, can compete for one uh, through the In-College Scholarship Program or ICSP. Um, and then that's uh, very competitive as you can imagine, uh, but we do have a lot of su success. Um, uh, with cadets picking up scholarships after they have entered uh, Air Force ROTC. Uh, I encourage you to go to the website that's listed there on the page. Um, and um, uh, there it explains the different types of scholarships that are available, the timelines, uh, and that should answer many of your uh, scholarship questions. And it will also, you can sign up for um, the, uh, the interview as well. Uh, when you go to that website. And just, I wanna leave you with, uh, you don't have to have a scholarship to join Air Force ROTC. Um, you can uh, join the program without one. As a matter of fact, I came through uh, Air Force ROTC without a scholarship. And um, so there's, there's plenty of opportunity, um, no matter you know, which category you fall into. I look forward to hopefully seeing you uh, in the uh, fall semester at uh, one of our schools that fall under our detachment. And, and again, if you have any questions, please reach out to our website and contact us through there. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Huff. Susan Collette Forsyth is also joining us. She is the Recruiting Operations Officer for Army ROTC at the University of Virginia and Liberty University. Hi, it's nice to be here. And when you uh, go visit Colonel Huff, you can just come down the hallway after you visit the Air Force and then you come down and see Army ROTC. So I'm the recruiting operations officer responsible for scholarships and enrollment 
at the University of Virginia and Liberty University. And really, you've had such great presentations today from the military schools and the Air Force ROTC. What I want to talk about really is about creating your options in your quest to become a second lieutenant in the United States Army. So as you can imagine, the path through the United States Military Academy at West Point is very different from the path through Army ROTC at UVA. I can speak from experience since I was, uh, I am a graduate of West Point many eons ago. You have to decide what environment works best for you. But in your planning, you wanna make sure that you consider preparing for both attending a military academy or attending a civilian institution like the University of Virginia. Virginia has many excellent colleges and universities that offer Army ROTC. There are 11 host programs with another 11 cross enrolled or extension programs. You live a typical cadet life. So you don't wake up in, uh, you're not in uni uniform every day. At the University of Virginia, our military uniform day is Tuesday. You have PT that day at 6 a.m., a leadership lab in the afternoon. And depending on your year group, you're either taking a 50 minute course or you're taking a two hour course. You attend your class, physical training, leadership labs. We have one weekend field training exercise per semester. There are wonderful overseas summer opportunities as well, including internships, going to airborne school or air assault school, critical language programs, and upon graduation, you will receive a commission as a second lieutenant, either in the active, you compete for active duty in the active army, the army reserve, or the army national guard. I think one other thing that is really important to talk about when we're looking at a civilian university like the University of Virginia or Liberty University is that you have the possibility of becoming an army nurse. There are undergraduate nursing programs that allow you then to graduate become commissioned and then go into the Army Nurse Corps. We consider our Army nurses superheroes, so you could join them. There are three or four years Army ROTC scholarships, and because the Army is big, we offer a variety of different opportunities than, say, the Air Force or the Navy. You can apply for these scholarships. You just go to the GoArmy.com website. We give out about 2,000 scholarships that can go to any school that has a four-year Army ROTC scholarship program. This year, the application will open on June 12th. There are three boards, one in October, one in January, and one in March. And your application is considered at each of these boards. So I welcome you to apply to the United States Military Academy at West Point or any academy and also take a look at applying for the Army ROTC scholarships because you don't know when you might decide to you know, change your mind or come into the UVA you know, or Liberty University and we have a fantastic program. If you have any questions, please go to the armyrotc.virginia.edu and I'm on the website and please contact me and I'll be happy to help you. Good luck to you and your endeavors. I wish you all the luck. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Colette Forsyth. A representative from Navy ROTC at the University of Virginia couldn't be with us today, but Lieutenant Zachary Dalkey did provide his contact information for everyone who would like to reach out to him about the program. We also have Mr. Mullen with Larry Mullen with us today. He is the Deputy Chief for the Department of Defense Medical Examination Re Review Board. Whether you're applying to an academy or to an ROTC program, you will need to have a physical. Mr. Mullen can explain this process. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Mullen. Uh, thank you very much. I have a few minutes here. I've got the stopwatch so I don't go over time. Uh, the most important thing that uh, I can tell you is my email address. So whether you're applying for any of the service academies, ROTC programs, uh, or multiples thereof, and I would highly recommend that you apply to a few service academies, a few ROTC programs, and a few civilian schools, 
because the position that you want to find yourself in, you've applied to nine schools and have nine letters of acceptance. Now you are in the driver's seat to go ahead and pick the one that you like, but it takes some effort on your part. The good news is you'll get one medical exam for any and all of the programs. We'll just go ahead and review it uh, for all the different services. The only difference in the standards, in the medical standards is in vision, and suffice it to say that the C services, you need to have good color vision, um, but all the other standards are pretty much the same. Uh, the one key thing that I would like to present to you is if you Google DODMERB, that's the Department of Defense Medical Exam Review Board, the acronym on the slide, on the top left-hand side, there's questions on the process. And basically that's a document that I write. I wrote it on the 1st of January. The next one will be on the 4th of July. When you're old like me, you pick dates that you can remember. Uh, so therefore you can go ahead and see what the process is. You can see if you're disqualified, what the waiver process is, and you'll have all the information available plus my email address. So my main function is to facilitate you if this is something that you wanna do in getting through the medical process. And I must say to the parents out there, General Jurek is right on with uh, congratulating and thanking all the parents and the grandparents. I take a little bit of a different approach. Uh, their contact should be within the house. They can give you sage counsel and advice. But when you talk to the congressional staffers, the admissions office, when you email Dodmerb, it needs to come from the applicant, not from the parents or the grandparents. Uh, this is a time of transition, and this is where you need to go ahead and learn how to do that communication, uh, and then go ahead and reach the goals and the objectives that you've set for yourself. So, on the medical portion, I will make it as simple as possible to navigate through. I can't guarantee what the outcome will be, but I can guarantee that at any time, if you have questions, there's my email address. You can ask questions. And because we're a little bit behind, I'm gonna turn it back to Charlotte Hurd so that we can catch up and finish on time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. And I'd like to, again, thank all of our speakers today. You will now have the opportunity to attend breakout sessions with representatives of the service academies. To do so, go back to the lobby area and select agenda to see the five sessions. We'll have two rounds of these. Once both rounds of breakout sessions have concluded, you can visit with some of today's speakers in the lounge area. Thank you for joining us today, and I wish you the best of luck in your pursuit of a military career. Good morning. I'm Jocelyn Gray from Senator Warner's office, and we are so pleased to have Second Lieutenant Jake Conkey from the United States Air Force Academy with us today. He'll give a brief presentation, and then you'll have the opportunity to ask questions using the question and answer box. Thank you so much for joining us, Second Lieutenant Conkey. Take it away. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself there. So hi, everyone. Uh, so like what was discussed, I'm Second Lieutenant Jay Conkey. I'm an admissions advisor for USAFA, and I represent the DMV area, so all of DC. Uh, most of Maryland, if not all of Maryland, and then uh, Northern Virginia for the most part. Um, and this is kind of a, uh, a, um, a kind of a starter job for a lot of the, the casual lieutenants that graduate the Air Force Academy as pilots. So I'll be doing this until I go to pilot training in, um, uh, yeah, coming up on a month now. So May 23rd, that's when I start my pilot training at Columbus Air Force Base in Mississippi. So until then, I'm a uh, you know, I have my mentees, I have my candidates that I look after, and I also have my other high school students that, uh, you know, reach out and I help guide through the admissions process for the Air Force Academy. And I'll go on to another brief presentation here real quick, um, kind of discuss some uh, key points with USAFA. Um, so I guess starting off with just the basics, so obviously a four-year um, public university, uh, 
no tuition, no nothing, being that it's a government school. Uh, so, and I'll just list off real quick some of the majors and minors we, we offer. So it is a STEM-based school, so we're definitely more engineering and science-based. So, you know, you got your, your biology, chemistry, uh, you know, math, physics, things like that. Aeronautical engineering, astronautical engineering, uh, electrical engineering, mechanical en engineering, systems, space ops, cyber science, computer science. So, uh, you know, we got a lot, like I said, mostly STEM-based stuff. And you, when you do go to USAFA, you're getting your bachelor's of science. So even though um, I myself was a business major, and sorry, let me back up a little bit more. So we got our, um, <clears throat> our English as well, uh, history, and then we do have quite a few social sciences like business, uh, political science, humanities, you know, econ, and other things like that. Um, so uh, like I was saying, being that you're getting your bachelor's of science, uh, you will have to take, even though, like, let's say you're an English major, you're going to be taking, uh, you know, a semester of astronautical engineering, aeronautical engineering, uh, bio, physics, chem, uh, Calc 1, Calc 2, so things like that. Um, and, and you even have to take a law class, too, and, and a lot of um, just kind of other general, um, uh, I guess, like broad spectrum classes. And, and the goal of that is just to create a, uh, you know, well-diversified leader. Um, and then moving on, uh, just talking about some of the major programs we have there, here that a lot of uh, students look forward to and, and end up taking over the summer or even the academic year. We got our soaring, uh, which is our gliding program. We get towed up by... Um, kind of like a plane, like a Cessna, and you have your instructor pilot who's a student who um, teaches you how to, you know, glide around the Rocky Mountains and, and uh, use physics to, you know, keep the plane up in the air and, and a lot of cool things like that. So that's a, a program that most, if not all, cadets opt in to take. And these are all uh, voluntary. So if you don't want to take these, you don't have to. Uh, we have our um, our actual uh, flying program called Powered Flight, where you actually fly a, um, it's a T-53. It's kind of like a slightly smaller version of a test or almost a Tesla of a, um, a Cessna. And uh, you have your instructor pilot who's an actual Air Force pilot. You know, he might have flown fighter jets or, you know, C-130s or something or C-17s, things like that. And this is kind of like their side thing or, you know, maybe when they're done flying those planes, they're kind of just like uh, still around the, you know, you saw the area and they're helping students learn how to fly these little things. So I was actually lucky enough to take this one. Uh, with my schedule and it's about uh, three weeks long. And then if you, uh, you know, meet all the syllabus requirements, you can even solo, um, you know, and I'd probably say 15% of the kids that take the class wound up soloing, the other half kind of just take it as um, a gateway into the program to see if they even do want to fly. Um, another program is our skydive program. And uh, that is definitely one of our more popular ones being that your first jump is solo and you get five total jumps. And we're the only program in the country that does your first jump or I think in the world actually, that your first jump skydiving is solo. So uh, of course there's a lot of training that goes with that because they're not just gonna let you jump out of a plane you know, your first, for your first time alone if you're not ready. They have about two weeks of uh, ground ops and you know, emergency training and all that thing. So they make sure you're, you're pretty dialed in by the time you're jumping out of the plane. And then we have our survival training and other things like that. So every summer, uh, I mean obviously, you know, before you start your freshman year at the academy, you're gonna be going through your basic training and then after, but your military, your military training doesn't end there. So you're going to have other military style trainings like survival training, seer training, uh, things like that, where they teach you how to land nav, uh, you know, survive out in the wilderness and uh, do things like that. And the Air Force Academy's campus is um, pretty big. It's about, I would say, uh, four acres or so, maybe maybe five or five ish acres um, uh, with and that's just, I guess, with like office buildings, your classrooms, your dorms, things like that. But the actual Air Force Academy base is like thousands and thousands of acres. So it's huge. And you do all this on base. So it's really cool because you're going to have half your basic training like on the campus area. And that's kind of where they teach you your intro to, you know, uh, live in as like a military person. And then you have your other half where you're in Jack's Valley, which is also on the Air Force Academy base. But it's like five miles north of the campus. So like I was saying, the, the, the base is huge and there's so much wildlife and wilderness and you do a lot of training out there, which is really fun. Um, and then uh, moving on to career opportunities. So about uh, out of our, uh, it's about, we have, each class is about a thousand kids, maybe a little bit um, more than that. I think my graduating class was 950 actually, but we start out with about uh, 12 to 1400, I would say. And then of course we lose some due to, uh, you know, uh, kids transferring 
Um, you know, maybe just the academy is not for you, in which you you can leave USAFA up until the start of your junior year. So the second you walk in for your junior year classes, uh, you're you're now opted into your five year minimum, mil, uh, you know, Air Force requirement uh, post graduation. Um, but before then, you know, if if it's if Air Force Academy is not for you and you don't see yourself having a career in the military, then you can by all means leave before the start of your junior year and you owe nothing to anyone, which is uh, definitely a cool opportunity there just because it's kind of just a, a quick out if, if you know it's really not for you. But that's also very, very rare. Um, but moving on uh, to the career opportunities. So like I was saying, about a thousand of us per class, about 500 of us will go pilot and the other half uh, kind of get distributed amongst the other normal Air Force jobs, I would say which are, you know, acquisitions, contracting. Uh, you can be a finance officer, cyber op officer, an intel officer, personnelist, uh, things like that. We also, you can also be an engineer. Um, however, with the engineering uh, jobs, you have to major in that engineer. So you can't be like an English major and, and uh, you know, be an astronautical engineer in the Air Force because obviously that wouldn't add up and you'd probably have no idea what's going on. So you can't do that. And then um, backing up a little bit, so those engineering and those normal jobs I was talking about with those, you know, personnel, logistics, acquisitions, those jobs, those are five year minimums. And then you, you know, moving up with the with the uh, with the length of time you owe the Air Force, uh, that's going to be in the pilot realm, uh, you know, drone pilot, things like that. So a drone pilot, for example, owes six years. And then uh, if you're like myself, that an actual pilot, you owe 10 years post training. So pilot training is about a year-ish, year and a half, maybe even two years long. But my 10-year clock doesn't start until I finish that, and then I fly for the Air Force for 10 years. Um, and then again, just kind of reiterating, about half the class will go pilots, and then the other half kind of do those normal jobs I was referring to. And then about 10% of those kids will also go to graduate school. And graduate school is very, 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 very competitive. So um, I just want to reiterate, it is extremely competitive because, I mean, you're dealing with the top kids at the academy and only 10% will go to grad school, period. And that's distributed amongst the kids going to law school, medical school, um, you know, dental school, like things like that. So a very competitive environment, with grad school. Um, and then uh, if I didn't say already, the Air Force Academy is in Colorado Springs, Colorado, about an hour south of Denver. And of course, you know, you got all the mountains and ski resorts. Uh, within a day's drive away so uh, depending on like probably an hour and a half to two hours depending on what mountains you're going to but that was definitely a highlight of my cadet career at the air force academy you know me and my friends every weekend in the winter we would all uh, go to Vail or you know breckenridge and go skiing for the weekend and things like that um and then another uh, more just significant things uh, that you saw has to offer so kind of like i already discussed no tuition costs you get free room and board uh, free medical and dental coverage because you are considered active duty when you're a cadet. You even get paid to go to school. So freshman year, you probably get paid around like $300 to $400 a month. And then by senior year, you're making around 1000 a month. And that's cash money that goes, uh, it's a direct deposit straight in your account. So uh, you can do as you wish with that. You can save it. If you want to send it home, you can send it home. If you want to spend it, you can spend it. So you can do what you want. And then you also get a guaranteed career, which I just want to reiterate is a, you know, um, a thing that a lot of us are grateful for, especially nowadays with COVID and everything. A lot of things, a lot of friends that I know that went to civilian schools that they had their jobs promised, you know, but with COVID hit, uh, they did they lost their job offers. And if you go to the Air Force Academy or really any academy, you know, you're going to be guaranteed a paycheck the second you graduate, which is uh, really, really awesome. Um, and then getting started. So you're just going to go to academyadmissions.com. You're going to click start your online application and then you're going to click your pre-candidate questionnaire, which opens up March 1st. So uh, you know, we are now in that window for all the juniors out there that are going into their senior year. And then I can also drop my email into the Q&A or uh, Q&A box there. And uh, so you guys can get in contact with me if you have any specific questions after this. And that's awesome. All. Thank you so much. Well, we can start taking a few questions. I know we've got about nine minutes left. Um, so folks on uh, in the presentation, please feel free to drop your questions in, but we do have a few pre-submitted ones um, that we can get started with. So uh, the first one is, what type of leadership skills do you look for in a student? 
So like similarly to the other academies, we just look for the, the, the full picture. We, we want kids that are you know smart in the classroom, but we also want kids that you know are doing a lot of good extracurriculars and, and doing sports and, and really showing and exercising their ability to, to lead. So you know a lot of the students that we get that apply are team captains. They're really involved in uh, like you know volunteer work in their communities, you know raising money and and distributing it, distributing it like amongst their community and, and things like that. So we just look for the full picture. You know, I see a lot of kids that, you know, are really killing it in the classroom, but they don't really have anything to show outside the classroom. And that's kind of, that, that would penalize them obviously. So uh, we just look for the, the full picture there. Awesome. Erica asks, how do you recommend preparing for the CFA? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to give a pretty basic answer here. So the CFA is the Candidate Fitness Assessment. For those that don't know that, um, it's the, the test that's the fitness test that's part of the application, and it's a it's a run, it's push ups, it's sit ups, it's pull ups, and you know uh, I actually so I play I was an athlete at the Air Force Academy, Air Force Academy. I played football, so I'm just going to kind of give the simple answer like just practice the test. Like you, you know if you have a test for a run, like you know you should probably start going on runs and. And getting in shape, in, in running shape, you're going you're gonna to have to do push-ups. I recommend doing some push-ups and, and getting good at push-ups. So that's really uh, all I have to say about that. But, I mean, we, uh, you know, all, all cadets are athletes, and that's kind of a saying that, that uh, we all take to heart. So we kind of expect everyone to, you know, be in shape. And you guys are young. You, you have 18 and up to 23-year-olds coming in, and, you know, you should be in the best shape of your life, I would argue. So, yeah. Um, John asks, what's your favorite part of the Air Force Academy? My favorite part was probably the location. I fell in love with Colorado. Uh, like I kind of already said, you know, going uh, skiing and snowboarding every weekend in the winter. Uh, you know, I'll probably never be in an area like that again so close and have the time to do that. So I definitely uh, uh, took advantage of that. And I highly recommend for all you guys that are, uh, you know, looking to apply and, you know, hopefully become cadets. You guys definitely take advantage of that too and don't take that for granted by the time you graduate. Great. Diego asks, what is the process to become a pilot like at the U.S. Air Force Academy? So uh, the process is the same for all other jobs. You just have your preference sheet. So uh, I think now it's in your the end of your junior year, you're going to get um, eight slots to put in whatever jobs you want. Um, so with myself, I put in pilot and then it's going to register that I want pilot is my number one preference. And a few months later, your, your commanding officer and your squadron is going to gather everyone together when, the, when we have your job drop night and you're going to see if you get pilot. Um, but I guess the get diving into the specifics, obviously you need good eyesight and things like that, but you can't even be a cadet in the first place if you, know, you have uh, severe medical issues and things like that. And also the Air Force is kind of is getting more lenient in terms of, um, you know, the medical waivers and things like that. So there's a will, there's a way. If you want to fly, the Air Force will pretty much do everything they can to get you to fly. Um, I think the only thing that's kind of um, immediate cutoff would be if you're, like, severely colorblind or something like that. Liam asks, does my major of interest have an effect on the consideration of my appointment? Not necessarily, but... We would want to see that the classes you are taking in high school are uh, the harder classes that your high school has to offer, per se. We don't want to see like fuzzy stuff. Like if you're acing cooking in, you know, wood shop or something, like obviously, you know, that's not, you're, you're not going to be as competitive as the kids that are taking like Calc 1 and Calc 2 or even Calc 3 already. Um, uh, but as far as the major of interest, you know, I mean, we definitely aim for the more STEM-based people, but if you're really interested in business, I wouldn't say that's going to penalize you in any way. Jared asks, can you explain the Academy interview process and provide any tips? Um, I would just handle that as any other interview, just kind of be on your toes and be ready to answer any question he's going to throw your way. It, every... A low that's going to give the interview is going to be different. Like I even got asked a, like some random questions about sports, and I mean, given I was you know a recruited athlete, so I guess mine was a little bit different. But um, you know, the, they might ask some questions about politics just 
to kind of throw you off and you know um, articulate, like uh, create a um, like an answer, like the best answer you can, even though it's you know kind of a, a funky question. They just want to see you think and kind of get, uh, keep you on your toes. So I would just say be ready for anything. And, and but confidence is key. They want a confident person and they want a uh, a people person too. You know, if you get in there and you're not really that personable. You know they're they're gonna definitely take note of that and say this person is not gonna be an adequate leader or you know something along those lines. Great, Isabel asks, what is a day in the life as a cadet in the Air Force Academy? So um, I guess I'll give the more general one and I'll maybe dive into my own personal experience. So I'd say every one for the most part is gonna be up between six thirty ish. Uh, every day and if when you're a freshman you have what we call minutes which you stand out in the hallway at attention and you call your minutes so you call the meal of the day the time it is uh, how much time it is until um, you know the, the first class and, and just kind of other random things like that you might other squadrons might ask your freshman to do current events and other things and that's about three days a week but for the most part everyone's up around like 637 classes are from 730 to uh, like 3.30 every day, everyone has noon meal formation and you march to lunch every day and that's at 11.55 and then you're in your seats at uh, 12.05 I believe and everyone eats lunch together and then after lunch that's when all the athletes will uh, go down to their, their you know sports facilities and start practice and everything and everyone else will either con continue with class or go back to your squadron and you can start studying doing homework things like that so if you're a non-athlete I would say your day ends around three at the latest and then you pretty much the rest of the day is yours. Uh, depending on some days, you might have a training with your training officer, and that's about an hour long, but that's pretty low threat. You might go on a run, do some push ups, uh, you know, things like that. And then, um, obviously, with the uh, extracurriculars, with, you know, flying and like the soaring and gliding classes, those are going to be um, that, that's an actual period. So you might have your first period at 7 30 be soaring, which is you're going to get bust down to the airfield and go fly around. Then you get bust back, and then you might have your period two class, which could be like physics or something. So uh, it, everyone's schedules are kind of different. Great. We have time for one last quick question. Um, all service, Yvette asked, all service academies have their traditions. Which one was your favorite at the Air Force Academy? I'd have to say jumping into the fountain upon uh, finishing your final, your, your last final uh, senior year. So the whole thing with that is uh, assuming you pass all your finals and you're good to graduate, you immediately run outside and you're, you know, you gather your, your friends together and you all jump in the fountain uh, with, with in full uniform. So it's pretty cool. A lot of cool pictures are taken uh, with that. And uh, sometimes the commandant will even come out and like this and the superintendent and they facilitate or not facilitate it, but you know, they're, they're observing it. And it's just a, a tradition that's been, there. I don't know how long, but it's been there for a long time. So that was definitely awesome. And a, a feeling of relief when you finish your last final and you go jump in the fountain. So it's cool. All the, I think the other academies do that as well. Awesome. Well, that brings us to time. So I just want to say thank you to you and thank you to all of our participants. Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the second breakout session for uh, Senator Mark Warner's Academy Day. Uh, my name is Zach. Uh, I'm uh, on Senator Warner's staff. Uh, I work as a part of his defense, uh, foreign policy and national security team. Um, we're lucky to be joined this morning by uh, Lieutenant Bradley Nelson, who uh, is here to talk to us on behalf of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Um, and uh, one thing I'll note before I turn it over to him is uh, that if you have any questions uh, during his presentation, uh, go ahead and use the Q&A tab over on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we're going to do a presentation for uh, the first half uh, of our time here, uh, and then uh, we'll jump to a little Q&A at the end here. Um, so without further ado, I'll uh, turn it over to Lieutenant Nelson. Thanks, Mr. Lewis. Can't be honored enough to be here today with Senator Mark Warner, Ashley Warren, and again, Mr. Lewis here for putting on just an incredible uh, program, really one of the best in the country, so well organized. So uh, really helping us uh, share more about what is an opportunity to um, attend a service academy and serve your country here with a sense of kind of honor and purpose. Uh, with that, I'm a 2013 graduate of the United States Coast Guard Academy, originally from Florida, came up to the Coast Guard Academy to pursue my four-year education as well as an opportunity to serve in, I would say, the world's most premier Coast Guard. So with that, I'm going to do a quick review of the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Academy, and really take some questions here at the end as well as be available in the 
the lounge. I can't get to your questions, have an opportunity, you can always reach out to me via call, FaceTime, text. I'm happy to connect you with people out in our Coast Guard fleet, whether it's an aviator or a Marine Mar or response. So I'll make sure your questions get answered and you can get as much out of today's event. With that, again, quick review, 2013 grad, I spent two years afloat on a Coast Guard cutter, helping do our drug, counter drug and narcotic missions, migrant interception, repatriation, environmental response, search and rescue. I got to then help run a search and rescue command center here out of the state of Connecticut for several years. Really probably one of the most rewarding jobs I think I'll ever do in my lifetime. And got the opportunity to save somebody's life, help plan large scale search and rescue cases, I also had the opportunity to do environmental and disaster response, so uh, responding to hurricanes, big environmental oil spills, uh, hazmat responses, contingency planning for large threats that this nation faces on a daily basis. So kind of really encompasses here what the Coast Guard mission is, which is a multi-mission maritime service for one of the nation's six armed services. Our nation is to protect the public, the environment, and our economics interests throughout our ports and waterways, both here nation front as well as a worldwide presence. We've got Coast Guard assets as far north as the Arctic, as far south as South America, Colombia, uh, the Pacific Coast, the Atlantic Coast, um, Guam, Hawaii, you name it. We've got a, a worldwide presence, you know, a 24-7 a presence, 365. We've got Coast Guard um, men and women who are out there right now patrolling our waters to ensure our nation's safety and security. Um, really, um, our goal, again, is to uh, ensure our nation's maritime safety, security, and stewardship. Again, we're always protecting the people, the public, and our economic interests. Um, I'd like to say that uh, we're both a law enforcement agency as well as a military force. We're a humanitarian service, so I always want to highlight that. We serve in the Department of Homeland Security, so a slightly different mission set than what Department of Defense is doing day to day. Uh, we're really, again, a protector of the United States, both during times of peace and the war. We have served in all of the Great World War, so there's definitely that possibility that we're always going to deploy down range. Uh, but for the most for, you know, part, day to day, we're here serving home front, protecting our nation's shores. A little bit of kind of the Coast Guard missions here. Again, the more common ones, search and rescue, uh, environmental response, maritime law enforcement. Um, homeland Security, you know, you could turn on the news probably during the summertime and uh, you pray without, uh, you know, fail, you're going to see probably a Coast Guard uh, highlight in the newspaper somewhere from a drug bust or a big hurricane that might be happening where the Coast Guard is, is you know, really at the forefront working with our partners from both a federal standpoint as well as state and local partners to uh, effectively execute our missions on a day-to-day -day basis. The nice thing is that, again, uh, the missions that you do have a sense of purpose. Uh, you're responding to real cases. They've got real impact. So, again, oftentimes somebody's life is at stake or a nation's security can be at stake. A little bit about the Coast Guard Academy. Now that you've got an idea of what the Coast Guard kind of does, the Coast Guard Academy is a four-year academic institution primarily focused on your professional growth and development. Um, really, the, the goal here is a mission of focus to develop officer-ready leaders of character who embody the Coast Guard's core values of honor, respect, and devotion to duty, influence, inspire others to do the same. We're one of the smallest federal service academies, so a very tight-knit uh, family community. We represent uh, really across the entire United States as well as international students who come aboard. We're one of the most diverse service academies. A little bit about the stats there, right around 690, 700 math, 60 verbal. Um, so be sure you're getting those SAT, ACTs in now. If you're a sophomore, start taking the PSAT juniors, get those tests in because they matter. We start, uh, you know, we still are uh, requiring those and then probably a test optional potentially here for regular admission. But we've got a tremendous number of students who compete in a varsity high school, you know, sport. About 65% of our students at the academy play in NCAA sports. So really looking for students with an athletic or music background who can contribute to the academy community. It is competitive, like all service academies, right around a 13 to 14% selection rate. So be sure you're putting together a quality application package. 
We don't require congressional nominations, so one less kind of hoop to jump through. Um, very similar to all the SURF academies where same benefits, same medical benefits and pay. Flight school options, so uh, about 20 to 25 percent, uh, or sorry, 20 to 25 spots will be allocated for students who want to attend uh, flight school immediately after graduation. Otherwise, you've got opportunities for really that first five years to continuously apply to flight school. About 80 to 85 percent of the officers who are applying to flight school will be able to attend flight school. You'll go down to Navy Pensacola's flight school for that 18 or about uh, about 18 month program. So pretty intense. It's about a million dollars that they're pumping into you for training. So uh, great because you get to train right alongside uh, Naval Academy grads and Naval officers. And then you'll come back to the Coast Guard community to fly either a fixed wing or a helicopter or asset. 85% uh, of officers decide to stay with the Coast Guard beyond their five year service obligation. So I always generally say it's, it's a small Coast Guard family. Uh, people enjoy the missions that they're doing. They enjoy coming to work. They enjoy that rewarding sense of job satisfaction. Definitely recommend that you do your homework on the service academies. We're ranked uh, number one regional college in the north, top ranked public school in the north as well. Again, you're going to get a world class STEM education. Senator Warner, you know, said best that you, regardless of what service academy you're going to attend, you know, you're going to get a world class, you know, opportunity to both um, pursue your academic education as well as get a lots of hands-on kind of on-the-job training as well. Some of our academic offerings, we've got nine academic majors. Really do your homework is what that you want to, you know, what is it that you want to study? Your, your questions are going to be, what is the major are you interested in? Why? That's your, your personal statement number one. So we're looking for students to have a pretty clear sense of what is it they want to study at the academy. What about their background is compelling that makes them a good fit, you know, for their program of interest. So we're putting a, a $400,000 investment into you over that four year, uh, you know, period to hire you immediately upon graduation because uh, you've got that degree and that experience and that you're going to be able to better benefit the Coast Guard with that technical knowledge. Your 200 week program is leadership driven. We have a cadet regimental system that's uh, really based upon the progressive challenge and responsibility and accountability. So as each year goes on, you're given more responsibility as well as more accountability uh, with that kind of uh, that leeway. Uh, we have got an honor concept like all service academies, as well as the opportunity to attend different service academies for an exchange program when you are a second class. And really one of the best parts of being at the academy is the opportunity to spend your summers out in the fleet. So when you're going into your uh, freshman summer or your, your junior summer, you're going out to the fleet each summer to go board our Coast Guard ships and aircrafts and operational units to find out what is it the Coast Guard does. You get trained right alongside our Coast Guard professionals to really gain that sense of on-the-job training. You'll start earning certifications that when you graduate, you're going to go immediately to the fleet to start your job on day one. So I got to spend my time in Alaska as far north as that, all the way as far south as Cuba, doing everything from uh, aids to navigation to search and rescue and drug enforcement. So I really just had an incredible uh, experience traveling the world, getting to see different countries and getting kind of begin that hands on training to really learn what is it the Coast Guard uh, you know, does on a day to day basis as well as so sailing aboard Coast Guard Cutter Bark Eagle, our sailing ship. So you'll get, you know, certainly your, your feet wet with that uh, opportunity and learning how to, you know, learn seamanship skills and navigation and living with your, your classmates. Um, throughout your, your 200 week program, it's really going to be a kind of, a, again, a, uh, an imageable and team based learning, you know, experience that reinforces the classroom theory. You're going to be using simulators, waterfront assets, again, our Coast Guard assets to, to gain all that sense of on the job training. So I like that. I like getting out to our tugboats and our training boats and our sailing boats, getting out into the water, you know, on a daily basis to, to really gain that sense of, of kind of on the job training. Some of the athletic opportunities, we've got just about two dozen NCAA uh, activities and, and club sports uh, at the academy. So we recommend that you reach out to the coaches. We've got an opportunity to go onto our athletics webpage to fill out the recruit me form. Do that now, do it early, get on the radar of the coaches. That way they can start working with you and kind of set the, the, the bar and the expectations of what they're looking for in an athlete to participate at the academy. So 
really just, again, a plethora of opportunities and really just a highlight to really for me to my 40 year experience getting to be a part of the cross country team, the triathlon team, just an opportunity to get out from campus every day and bond and connect with my, my classmates while still being competitive. Um, numerous cadet activities. We've got over 50 cadet activities. You can, you know, sh- tell me what that picture is. I'll mail you a t-shirt. So, uh, we've got just an opportunity to, to where you can get involved in the academy community. We've got, I did the ski and snowboard c- club, the surf club. You know, I kind of got out of my, my element from somebody from Florida. You know, I, I joined the ski club just to get out during the winters and go up to Vermont and just have some fun. So fellowship Christian athletes, you name it. There's just clubs that really were just meaningful activities for me to um, bond and connect with other members across the academy community. A little bit of a typical day. You're going to be getting up early. It's going to be a long day. Uh, you're going to be putting everything you've got into each day at the academy. Um, you're going to be going to breakfast. So you're going to have military formation in the morning, followed by some military training morning classes, followed by more formation and lunch, where you're getting together all thousand cadets for a lunch, really quite the experience. You've got the classes throughout the afternoon, then a sports period or music period, followed by dinner, more military training. Uh, probably very similar to what you're doing now, um, very similar to that of all the service academies. Your days are going to be often long but rewarding. So what I probably accomplished by 7.30 in the morning uh, in comparison to my peers in college, I felt pretty good about my day. So definitely maximized my, my day each and every day. Oftentimes up late at night studying, but, you know, I had fun. I knew it was a sense of purpose that I was given everything I had. Uh, so that at the end of my four years, I was ready to enter the fleet and, and really had all that technical knowledge, uh, you know, in my back pocket. Kind of the three-legged stool here, academics, leadership, and athletics. So we're looking for students that um, really kind of uh, embody all three elements here. They've got good academic coursework, good leadership uh, background. They're involved in their school and their community as well that they're athletically kind of fit and ready for the challenges at the Search Academy. Um, we definitely recommend if you're a sophomore, look into our summer program. That's a one-week program to come up and test ride the Coast Guard Academy and see it firsthand. For those juniors who signed up, we are expecting an in-person program, which we're super excited for, for this summer. Definitely recommend that you attend one of our virtual admission briefs that we do every week to give you kind of more insight into kind of the, the actual application requirements. But everything can be done online, very similar to that of other service academies. We're looking for letters of recommendation transcripts, scores, physical fitness tests, personal statements. Really the biggest thing here is just own the application, own the process, be motivated, be proactive, start early, be engaged with your admissions officers. We want to hear from you for your advocate in this process. So um, we need uh, to really be able to to represent you uh, when you're going through this process. So build a relationship with your kind of admissions officer, whether it's myself or somebody else in the future, so that really they can um, be your advocate and ambassador in this process is we're going to be the ones kind of representing you um, moving forward throughout that kind of six month process. So with that, I'll turn it over with some questions. Thanks for listening to me for a few minutes here. Great. Thank you, Lieutenant Nelson. Uh, There's some really great information uh, in that. Um, some folks have some follow-up questions to uh, a couple things that you talked about and, and then some, maybe some new topics. Um, you had mentioned that as part of the application process on, on that recent slide you put up, uh, that there's uh, a physical fitness evaluation. Could you talk a little bit about, a little bit more about what that eva- evaluation looks like um, in terms of the application process? And is there um, kind of an average or a, a minimum for a requirement for that test? Great. So it's different than this cadet fitness exam. We call it the PFE physical fitness exam. It's a mile and a half run, two minutes of cadence push-ups and two minutes of sit-ups. We have changed that over to two minutes of planks um, just because of COVID requirements. It's out of 300 points on average. Uh, 225 points is the yearly average. You can take it multiple times. So oftentimes I see a student just take it once. Um, they don't do so well and they didn't try again to retake it. So we encourage you throughout the entire application process to continue to train and then update your admissions officer with a new score. So if you're not satisfied, 
keep trying. It's more so of how you have applied yourself throughout that than just being a perfect score candidate. That's great if you are, but I'd rather see somebody who's motivated, who keeps trying to improve themselves. Overall, it's only about 5 or 10% of your overall application package. Great. Thank you for that. Um, you talked a little bit about, too, uh, I think, kind of the average GPA for the incoming class. Um, is there, you know, how strict is, you know, a GPA requirement? Is, is there a minimum GPA, for example, or, you know, how much give is there in that requirement, you know, when considered alongside, you know, leadership and activities and things like that? Academics are an account for about two thirds of the overall portfolio, but we are looking at candidates holistically. So maybe you had some academic turbulence at some point, or maybe you didn't get into all of the advanced coursework and APs and honors that you could. Uh, we do have a scholars prep program, like all service academies, where it's a one year academic prep program where you're going to be doing a year of college coursework with a guaranteed appointment opportunity following the conclusion of that program. A 3.0, I'd say, is a good uh, baseline minimum to, to kind of set the bar with. But on average, a 3.8 unweighted. But again, plenty of opportunities if you're not there. What is it else that you offer the academy? So if you're maybe not so strong academically, but you've got other talents and things you can contribute to the academy, that can kind of equally weigh things out and counterbalance things out. So um, definitely don't be discouraged if you're not there. The academy might see potential in other areas of your application. Great. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. Um, we had a couple questions about. Um, uh, athletics and, and the, the ability to get uh, recruited into uh, the Coast Guard Academy. Could you talk a little bit about what that recruitment process looked like? And, and we also had somebody who was looking specifically at weightlifting. Um, could they get uh, recruited for weightlifting? And, and what uh, opportunities are there at the Coast Guard Academy related to uh, that pursuit? Great. USCGA.com sports. Go onto the website, fill out the Recruit Me webpage. That will start a conversation with you and the coaches that will give them some information to work with, regardless of where you think you might be with recruitment. Let the coaches make that assessment. We've got tiers of where a student might be recruited. Maybe you're top Division three caliber or maybe you're more of a walk on or some you can try out for the team. Um, regardless, you know, we want those talents you know, here at the Coast Guard Academy. Highlight them on a resume or an activities page. We are looking for students who are going to offer an impact to the academy. Um, so it could be weightlifting. Um, you know, we've got a weightlifting club. We've got Olympic powerlifters here at the academy. You know, there, there is a competitive weightlifting group. We just offered or just opened up a state-of-the-art uh, multi-million dollar athletic training center here at the academy. So all of our weightlifters are super pumped right now. I can put you in touch with some of them. Reach out to me. Um, but again, that goes for all sports. Reach out to the coaches. Uh, start the conversation. They can bring you up for a sports camp, put you in touch with other athletes, part of the program now. So I uh, can't highlight that enough that we are looking for students with an athletic background. Great. And, and I think we'll close it off uh, in a minute here so folks can head to the, the lounge sessions after this. But um, a quick follow up to something you said, and then you know maybe I'll give you a closing point. Um, on the physical fitness evaluation, somebody wanted to know who can administer that um, for incoming applicants. Uh, but then maybe kind of as a, a broadly closing point, you know, what are things that you look for in terms of uh, leadership qualities and, and uh, leadership skills uh, in incoming students? Great. A coach, um, a, a school professional, um, scout troop leaders, civil air patrol, any of those people can administer the physical fitness exam. With COVID, we did start to allow parents to, to administer that exam. So we've got a list of them in the physical fitness handbook that you can download and I can share with you. Uh, but really any kind of school administrator or somebody within your community can administer for that exam. Um, and again, you can always retake it if you want to, which I highly encourage you do so. As far as leadership skills, we're looking for students who are involved in the school community, who are really a part uh, in taking kind of initiative and uh, charge of at least a handful of programs. It doesn't need to be uh, numerous, but find two or three things that you're really passionate about and really get involved in them. Focus on the we and the team. It's not so much about how many service hours you did and whether you did 600 or 1,000 or 200. Focus on the we and the team and focus on the action results and impact. What is it that you're involved in? How are you involved with it? What is it you're doing with that organization or that, that school club? Um, so 
find those things that you can be passionate about and highlight them in the activities page or a resume so we can learn more about that and the things that motivate you. So with that, I'll close it that we welcome you to attend one of our weekly admission briefs. We'll have students be able to visit the campus here later this summer and fall. I encourage you to create a Bearsden account so that you can start receiving information about the academy. I'll drop some information in the links here as well as the lounge. And then again, reach out to your admissions officer, myself. I'm happy to talk more about this process and, and put you in contact with other members of our academy community. So thank you so much for being a part of uh, the, the program here today and taking the time to learn a little bit about what a future with the United States Coast Guard might be. Thanks, Zach. Great. Thank you, Lieutenant Nelson, and thank you uh, to everyone who joined today. Um, there's uh, some information in the session chat, uh, some contact information for Lieutenant Nelson. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, there are follow-up opportunities for conversation, uh, both uh, back out in the lounge area uh, and then also afterwards. So, again, we appreciate you joining us today uh, and hope uh, you found this informative and, and hope that uh, you have a good rest of your day and good rest of your program. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Pillis. I'm with Senator Warner's office. Um, and I am happy to introduce you this morning to Lieutenant Colonel David Moss, who is an alum of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. Go ahead, Lieutenant Colonel. Thanks, Katie. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to apologize to everyone first. Uh, our admissions office uh, could not be available today, so they uh, asked if I could do it. It is uh, 5.30 here in Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, and I'm in a hotel room, obviously, so my apologies for that, uh, that I couldn't have a better background for you. But um, hopefully I can get your questions answered and, um, and you'll get some, uh, some good info out of what I have to tell you. So I'm going to start uh, by telling you um, what the Merchant Marine Academy is, where it is, uh, give you some information on why I think it's the best option for you, um, and then some other uh, info about commitments and things like that. Uh, so first and foremost, Merchant Marine Academy, what is it? Uh, it's a four-year institution, just like the other service academies. You graduate with a Bachelor of Science. Uh, the academy is on the North Shore of Long Island. It's just outside of Manhattan. It's on the old Chrysler Estate uh, overlooking Long Island Sound, so you get a great view of Manhattan. Uh, an amazing location, uh, beautiful campus, and it gives you access to a lot of extracurricular activities um, during your, your limited off time. Uh, what is the Merchant Marine? I'm sure some of you have a question as to what the Merchant Marine even is. Um, essentially, it's a civilian arm of the Navy. Um, and they're all civilians uh, that have no affiliation with the military or the government whatsoever, unless uh, there's a time of war and uh, then the Navy can commandeer merchant ships to transport military cargo around the world. So essentially, you're a civilian, uh, but you'd be working for the Navy in a time of war. Um, if, if such a situation were to arise. Um, what is your commitment upon graduation? Um, so for the Merchant Marine Academy, your commitment is five years active duty uh, or eight years reserve. Um, now, the difference with the Merchant Marine Academy and the other service academies is that uh, you are not tied to one service. So upon graduation, you can go into any service. You can go into uh, the reserves for those services. You can go active duty or you can go into uh, the Guard. And um, if you're not familiar with the Guard program, please uh, join me in the lounge later on. We can discuss um, what the Guard is and, and I can uh, give you some information about that. Uh, I myself was not familiar when I was in uh, high school either, so be glad to help you out uh, there. Um, uh, that said, I graduated. Uh, I went to the Air Force active duty, became a Lieutenant Colonel, flew airplanes, uh, and recently retired. So I'm a, a perfect example of the different options that you have coming out of the Merchant Marine Academy. Um, it kind of leads me into <clears throat> what do people typically do? What do graduates typically do upon graduation? Um, and, and there are uh, several typical jobs, but there is no single typical job coming out of the Merchant Marine Academy because the options are, are so vast. Um, so most people sail or work in a shoreside capacity for a shipping company. Um, or work in a shipyard. Um, so that would entail sailing on your Coast Guard license and you graduate with either a deck officer's license or an engineering officer's license. So the deck officers are uh, working the cargo operations and the navigation of the ship. Um, the engineering officers are working the, uh, the plant, the physical plant of the ship. 
So, uh, you know, the main engine and all the systems associated uh, with living on board a, a vessel. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, I mentioned the military. So uh, we have folks that graduate and go into every branch of the armed service. Uh, we have a lot of folks that go uh, Army logistics. We have folks uh, sailing uh, Navy surface warfare. Uh, we have folks who go Navy nuclear. We have folks who graduate and go into uh, the Coast Guard. We have folks that graduate and go to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, that's NOAA, oceanographic research vessels. So you could be uh, out uh, surveying uh, the, the seas with NOAA. Uh, and then we even have folks who graduate and go into maritime law. Um, so maritime law, very uh, niche um, law uh, that you, unless you have experience in the industry, you, you're probably not going to ever get into that. And so a very uh, interesting and lucrative career field. Um, so what else sets the Merchant Marine Academy apart besides these uh, tremendous options that you have upon graduation for uh, repaying your service commitment. Uh, well, first and foremost, we are the number two uh, public uh, university as ranked by U.S. News. Um, there's another school here who's ranked number one. Uh, it's our arch rival Coast Guard in full disclosure. However, I don't mind saying that because when you look at uh, the top 13 schools uh, for earnings after graduation, uh, we're the only school here in that list. Uh, it's 13 schools that uh, they uh, that they ranked. Where does the Merchant Marine Academy rank? Well, we're in the top half. Uh, we're number six on that on that ranking, and we beat out Princeton. So uh, there are a few schools that are that are above us, but I think uh, we definitely hold our own, and that speaks to the education that you're going to get there, uh, and and the alumni network that we have. It's a it's a very strong alumni network, and uh, and and you're you're essentially going to find a job that works for you um, and, and you're going to get paid for it. Um, and then finally, what, what's the other thing that sets the Merchant Marine Academy apart really is our sea year. So the sea year experience is uh, a minimum of 300 days out at sea, um, and that's to earn your Coast Guard license. So for 300 days, you are traveling the world as part of your education. Um, there is no better experience offered anywhere, in my opinion. Um, it really is a, a life-changing uh, seminal event um, in your uh, your college career. And uh, for me, I really had never left the state of Virginia other than to maybe go to North Carolina. Uh, and so when, when I went to the academy and got to go and see seven different countries before I graduated, it was truly uh, an amazing experience. So hopefully I've answered uh, some of your questions, but uh, at this point, um, I'd like to turn it over and, uh, and get some questions from the group, Katie. Okay, great. Um, so Kurt asks, what kind of majors does the Merchant Marine Academy offer? That, that is a great question, um, and it's changed a little bit uh, since I was there, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read them to you because I, I did write these down just in case somebody asks. So you have marine transportation. Um, that is essentially uh, a deck officer uh, training program. So you'll learn about uh, navigation. Um, you'll learn spherical trigonometry, which uh, is, is how uh, celestial navigation works. Um, uh, there's marine engineering, which uh, is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically mechanical engineering uh, with a uh, marine focus. Um, so you, you really, you're focused on uh, shipboard equipment. Uh, there's marine engineering systems which uh, gives you a little bit of a flavor of, of other um, engineering types. So you'll get a little more electrical engineering um, and, and, and some other technical fields kind of thrown in there. You'll get some of that in marine engineering too, but uh, marine engineering system gives you kind of a broader base of other uh, types of engineering. Uh, there's marine engineering and shipyard management, um, and that's kind of a mix between engineering and, um, and kind of what the uh, uh, the deck officers will see in their uh, business related courses. Uh, there's maritime ops and technology. That's kind of a blend of the two. Um, so you get marine engineering focus and then you get kind of a smattering of um, some marine transportation related functions and also some, uh, you get some different uh, options for uh, electives with the uh, technology piece of that. And then there's logistics and intermodal trans, uh, transportation. That's essentially the uh, the business side of uh, marine uh, shipping and transporting goods around the world. Um, and that 
not only focuses on the, the marine function, but the intermodal transportation part of that includes, you know, how are we getting uh, goods from the seaports uh, further inland, um, et cetera. Uh, so those are, are all of the um, majors available. Okay, great. Um, another question about law. Um, so Michaela asks, um, I would like to be a lawyer. Are there any pathways that the Merchant Marines offer for that? Sure, that, good question, Michaela. Um, I had no idea that uh, maritime law even existed before I went to the Merchant Marine Academy. Um, I have two friends who are maritime lawyers uh, and they've done very well for themselves. Um, it is a, like I said before, it's a very niche career field. Um, so for the two of them, essentially, um, the pathway that the academy gives you is a pathway into the maritime industry where you get experience and then uh, go to law school um, you know, with that experience in hand, uh, focusing on uh, maritime law when you're in, school, in your law school program, your JD, um, and then looking for a firm uh, coming out of law school. So uh, I'll just give you the, the quick synopsis of what uh, my buddy who lives outside of LA did. Um, so he graduated the academy. He sailed uh, for about a year on his license. The shipping company that he was working for, he got hired into a leadership program with them. Uh, spent another couple of years in that leadership program learning about the, uh, the shipyard program for them, how goods are uh, contracted with sales and things like that, and also you know, the, uh, the business model of that particular shipping company. And then uh, while he was in that program, he did some prep work for his uh, law school. Um, so he, he was working on his standardized tests for getting into law school um, and taking some, uh, some basic courses that he knew that he needed uh, to, that would give him a leg up um, when applying to law school. Uh, when he left, so he left the, uh, the shipping company and focused full time on law school. He, he had enough money in his pocket that he could do that for a couple of years. Um, and then when he graduated law school, he applied to different firms and he was picked up basically immediately right out of school because he had that background uh, uh, in the maritime industry. So he was immediately picked up by a maritime law firm. Um, and he's been, he was there for a long time. Um, and now he's actually, he's the inside counsel for um, Princess Cruise Lines. Um, and so that's, that's, that's where he's gone. Um, and he, he's done very well. I, I told the last group that, uh, you know, he lives up in the hills outside of LA and he drives a Ferrari. So uh, I'm a little bit jealous. Um, but essentially the, the pathway it gives you is experience in the maritime industry, which is truly the best leg up to get into a maritime law firm. Great. Um, so Kyle asked the question that I think that you um, will really enjoy answering, which is, are there pilot training opportunities? <laughs> there are pilot training opportunities. So I took, I took the more difficult route. Um, I went into the Air Force. Um, if you want to fly for the Air Force, essentially you have to make a, a commitment to them in your junior year uh, at the academy to say, no matter what, when I graduate, I'm going into the Air Force. Uh, even if I don't get a pilot training slot and you compete for your pilot training slot with other against other ROTC units around the country, you're essentially tied to a ROTC unit uh, in Manhattan at Manhattan College. And so you're treated like a ROTC student. Now they do give you uh, a bump in your GPA because the, uh, the they, they understand the academic rigor and uh, the regimental system adds some pressures. So you get about a half a point uh, GPA bump when you're competing against those other folks, you go to a Air Force field training program, which is a, a I think it's a four week summer program now, um, where you, you, know, you, you basically learn Air Force because you've learned all Navy customs and courtesies. So you have to learn what are the different things the Air Force does. And then you compete for a pilot slot. Now, we had four people who graduated um, in my class who went to the Air Force, all four of us got pilot slots. Um, so, but that is the harder route. There, there are Navy flight slots uh, dedicated to the Merchant Marine Academy every year. So, um, when graduates come out, they can go right into Navy flight. Um, I often tell people uh, when I go to these uh, different events that the only two uh, pilots I've met from the different services uh, were 
Coast Guard and 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 me. So it, you know, I think uh, if you want to go fly, um, the Merchant Marine Academy and the Coast Guard Academy actually give you uh, a very uh, strong percentage chance to do those things because most people aren't going to the Merchant Marine Academy looking to fly airplanes. Uh, so there's a smaller pool of people trying to do those things from uh, from our school. Um, so you have a very good chance of graduating and and going either Navy flight or or flying for another service. Uh, like I said, you can you can fly for Coast Guard does it a little bit differently. When you, if you graduate the Merchant Marine Academy, you go into the Coast Guard. You'd have to sail on a cutter for two years and then start their flight training program. Uh, Air Force, you go right away. Navy, you go right away. Okay. Um, Kofi asks if I've already completed two years of college, can I transfer to the academy? You can transfer. Um, there are limited um, credits that they will give you uh, for, for courses previously taken because essentially at the academy, everybody um, has to get the same core classes in. Um, but, but some of those classes that you've taken uh, will transfer. But you'll start as a freshman. <laughs> yeah, everybody comes in at the same point. You have to do four years. Yes. So that, that I think is important um, for folks to know that you can't transfer to an academy and keep your same academic standing. You have to really kind of start from the beginning um, if you want to do that, which people do do. Um, so. Yes, absolutely. Um, so describe the day in the life of a cadet. So a day in the life of a cadet, um, there's a, a morning reveille. So they uh, wake you up at the same time every day. Um, you, when you're starting out um, as a, a, a freshman, uh, your first year, essentially there's a, a lot more things that you have to do as you as you matriculate and you get uh, you know more advanced uh, in your career there. You know once you're a sophomore, junior, senior. Uh, the restrictions on you lighten up and, you know, life becomes a lot more fun. So I'm not going to sugarcoat that first year. It's uh, it, it's painful like it is at every other service academy. Um, so you'll wake up with Reveille as, uh, as a uh, fourth classman. You will um, march into uh, the dining facility in the morning all together uh, with your, your other fourth class freshman classmates. Uh, you'll eat breakfast together. Um, and then uh, once you're done with breakfast, classes start very early. Um, there, there's a lot to pack in to each academic day at the Merchant Marine Academy because, because of the sea year, uh, because you're not going to be able to take classes when you're out at sea. Uh, they pack a lot in uh, in the, uh, you know, the time that you're on campus. So you're starting classes you know, usually at 8 a.m. Um, is, is your first class. And uh, when you're a freshman, you're marching to class. Um, uh, you're squaring corners. You'll you'll see what all that stuff is about later on. Um, but you get through the academic day, and then most people uh, are either in, in intramural or um, or varsity sport. Uh, and so after the school day, uh, well, I forgot lunch too. You get to you get to march in with your entire company at lunch. So the whole school marches into the dining facility in the middle of the day. Um, and then your afternoon classes after that, and then uh, in the uh, the afternoon after classes. You're participating in whatever uh, whatever sport or extracurricular um, you're in. Uh, there's all kinds of different stuff. There's band. There's sailing. Uh, we're Division three for most of our varsity sports. However, uh, sailing we're Division one. Um, there's uh, other waterfront activities. So we have um, we call it uh, Power Squadron. So uh, essentially, the academy has a bunch of uh, power yachts, uh, a tugboat, uh, diff different types of uh, power vessels uh, that you can go and work on in the afternoons. You take them out. And, uh, you can take them out on the weekends. It's kind of a neat thing. Uh, same thing uh, for uh, sailing. We have an offshore sailing program, so um, you know fairly large yachts, sailing yachts that you as a, a, a cadet will maintain with a group of other cadets um, and and compete in uh, in, in sailing programs. Uh, that, are, that aren't uh, connected to the NCAA or, or, or uh, varsity sports. It's just uh, outside of that. It's a completely separate uh, entity in and of itself. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff down at the waterfront that you can do. 
Um, I did uh, track and cross country, which was a blast running all over the Northeast. Um, we went to just about every Division One Invitational. So even though we're a Division Three school, we were running against Division One programs all the time. Um, and then at night, uh, you are studying. So you, you kind of have uh, some freedom on when you eat dinner because everybody's doing something different uh, in the evening. So no marching in uh, as a group um, to the dining facility in the evening. You kind of show up, get uh, get whatever you can eat, and then off to studying, off to bed, and you start it again the next day. Okay, so maybe we have time really quickly for one more question. Um, what is the most important factor in getting accepted to the academy? That, that's a very good question. Um, and I will say that the academy really is a total person concept. Um, and and it, it, I think it's the same for uh, your, your congressmen and senators when they're looking at your uh, application package. They're really looking at the total person. So academics is a big part of that. You know, you got to meet the minimum. So you got to have a 2.5 uh, GPA minimum to get in. Um, but, uh, you know, the academy likes to see technical courses um, and, and, and certainly honors dual enrollment, um, those types of classes, uh, AP classes, th those will help you, um, they'll move you up in the stack. Um, so, you know, the academics is probably the biggest portion, um, but then the second biggest or maybe almost even equal is the leadership component. And so um, the academy really likes to see uh, some kind of leadership uh, in, in your uh, background. And, and that can be anywhere. That can be in clubs, it can be in sports, uh, it can be in faith-based organizations. It, it really, you know, just so long as you can demonstrate uh, that you've had some leadership, if you've been working in a job and you were a manager, you know, that's the kind of stuff they're looking for. And they understand that, you know, people come from different backgrounds. Um, so, so not everybody has the same opportunities. And so that's why I say they really look at the total concept um, the, the, the full person, but, but certainly academics and that leadership, uh, they're, they're going to weigh very heavily. Now, the other schools, I, I, you know, they have a big focus on um, athletics as well. Birch Marine Academy doesn't put as strong of a focus on athletics, um, but you know, athletics certainly uh, will help, um, but there, there's no uh, strong focus on that for the Birch Marine Academy. Okay. Well, um, so that's the end of our second session. Um, if you have other questions for Lieutenant Colonel Moss, um, you can talk with him in the lounge. Um, so thank you guys for joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys, and thank you for joining us for our second breakout session. So I'm going to do my best to give you guys the exact same information or better this time than I did for our last session. Please go ahead and throw up those questions as we go. I love to answer your questions, and that is what I am here for today. Um, if you guys want a full brief of the West Point um, application process and just about West Point in general, then please do check out the West Point Admissions Facebook page. We have recorded briefs um, on there, and then we also have live briefs generally every Wednesday at um, 7.30 Eastern time. So please check us out on Facebook for one of those briefs. Um, and so I see our first question is going to be from Jonathan. Jonathan asks if the parent, uh, candidate's parent is serving in the military now, should a congressional nomination be sought through the parent's home state or where you live now or through both states? That's a great question, Jonathan. So what I also want you to do is remember about the presidential nomination. For our candidates that are applying now, if you've already filled out your candidate questionnaire, you're going to be going into your senior year this fall. Um, you can also check out the nominations tab on your portal and for the information that we're going to want for a presidential nomination. If your parent is eight plus years and still serving or 20 years and retired, then you likely would qualify for a presidential nomination. So please check out the information that we're going to want for that. Now for yours, for the congressional nomination from the parent's home of record or from where you live now, the choice is up to you. So if you um, think that your chances are better in your parents' home uh, of record in that congressional district, then you can apply through Washington and through that congressional district uh, and for the two state senators too, of course, or you can apply through Virginia, that congressional district and those two state senators. You cannot apply for both. So generally what we see is candidates will try to determine which one they think is less competitive and apply through there. Um, but you cannot apply for both. You can't do both Washington State and Virginia. You have to choose one 
or the other, but still apply for the congressional representative and the two state senators, as well as the vice president. And then if you uh, also are eligible for a presidential nomination, apply for that as well. Apply for all the nominations that you're eligible for, okay? Um, so I see another question from Malik about submitting transcripts. You can wait until the end of your junior year. Um, I was always under the impression that SLE wanted your five semester transcript. They don't actually need it. And also that application is closed, so it doesn't matter anymore. But once you have that six semester transcript at the end of your junior year, you can go ahead and have your counselor send that in to your regional inbox. So if you are in the Southeast region, that's going to be admissions with an S, SE at westpoint.edu. And that's how your um, counselor can submit transcripts. Then once your application fully opens in June, they can also transmit them to us through the portal once you have um, asked them to do so. You'll put their email address in and some other information, and then they can submit it that way as well. Uh, Robert, I see you have a question about the summer uh, STEM camp. So the STEM camps are for, I want to say, like middle school and early high school, um, and I'm not sure when they're going to be um, putting out who has been accepted for those. I believe that the application got extended to one May for the STEM camps. So um, I would say always check your spam folder because for whatever reason, our emails love your spam folder. So please do check your spam folder regularly just to make sure you're not missing any correspondence from West Point um, because a lot of notifications end up there for some reason. Isabel, I see you have um, a question about the SAT, which is great. So. The SAT essay, as we know, is going away very soon. June or July, it will no longer be offered. So we can't really require something that doesn't exist. Uh, if you take the ACT, we still do encourage that you take the writing portion. But for the SAT, I know that that is not really a thing anymore. So you don't have to take the SAT essay. Um, if you do present with some risk for one of those tests and you haven't taken the essay, then depending on where you are within your district, we might ask for a timed writing sample, but that'll be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. If you're scoring 600 and above on the verbal for the SAT or in the upper 20s or 30s for the ACT, you won't even have to worry about being asked for a timed writing sample, most likely. Um, but if you are scoring in the lower 500s or in the lower 20s in your ACT, then depending on where, uh, where you sit within your district, we may end up asking you for a timed writing sample. So just be aware of that. Um, they will also be looking at your candidate statements. So please pay attention and actually treat them like it's a little, uh, like a mini essay versus like throwing some information down. I read some candidate statements this year and I was like, I don't know what you were doing other than like stream of consciousness onto the paper. So please do actually take those seriously because they will evaluate those if we think that you might have some English risk in your file. Uh, Rhonda has a minimum SAT score question. So um, if you meet all of the qualifications and you're a little bit lower than we would like, then we'll send you through risk reviews is what we will generally do, uh, depending on where you sit in your district. If you are scoring 400s on the SAT as one of my candidates, that is really, really risky and you would likely be disqualified for that. If you're scoring in the, the low fives in one section and you're scoring in 700s or higher in the other section and you've got a lot of other great things in your file, then we would send you through a risk review um, to see if our department, whichever department that is, math or English, thinks that you would still be okay for West Point. And then they would ultimately decide on your qualifications. Um, there are not minimum SATs because, like I said, we do have that risk review part. Um, but we do generally encourage you to obviously do the best that you can. And if you are in the upper fives on both sections, then you're probably not going to be a risky candidate for us. But again, the better that you do, um, the better that's going to help your file overall and your total score. As you see, our um, academics is worth 60% of your application. So that's your ACT or SAT scores, and then also your GPA. You do not, Karen, you do not have to take the ACT. So if you take the SAT, um, without the writing, that's fine. So if you've taken the SAT multiple times, if you've taken the ACT multiple times, if you've taken both the SAT and the ACT, send us all of your scores. Request that all of your scores are sent to West Point because we super score. If you've taken the ACT three times and you have different subsections on all of them, we will pull the highest subsection from each ACT to drive your file. 
same thing with the SAT. You've taken it multiple times. We will take the highest subsections from each to drive your file. What we're not going to do is cross test. So we will super score within a test. So within the ACT or within the SAT, but we can't take some of the SAT and some of the ACT to drive your file. So it has to stay test specific, but we do super score within those tests. Likewise, if you've taken both tests, send us both the ACT and the SAT because whichever test is best for your file overall is the test that we're going to use. So some people think, well, my ACT scores aren't that great. My SAT scores are better. So I'm only going to send the SAT scores. Send us all of the tests and our system will pull the tests that is best for your file overall. Uh, so Sarah, I see you have a question about medical school. So our candidates, um, we get this question a lot, actually. About 20 cadets or 2% of the core will go straight to medical school from West Point. They're just going to incur an additional commitment past their normal commitment to the Army for that schooling. Um, but it is possible. We do have, I have many friends from my year that graduated and went straight to medical school. Uh, and we do have about 20 cadets a year that are going to go straight to medical school after West Point. Uh, so, Kendall, you have a question about, is it better to apply right when it opens or take your time? I would love for you to finish your application by October. If you want to put October in your mind rather than January, that would be fantastic. Put October in your mind as when you want to finish your application. The sooner the better because we've still got to release you for medical. And if we can't release you for medical until January, you only have from January until April to get medically qualified. But if you get finished in October and we can release you for medical, that's a lot more time for you to get medically qualified. So do your best to uh, take the time that you need, but don't wait until the last minute. Do not submit me your CFA in January and expect for me to be able to get you a retest if you fail that CFA, which is your candidate fitness assessment. So I would say put an earlier deadline in, in your mind, like October and shoot for having your application done by October. That is a great question. Please, please, please do not wait until the last minute. I hate seeing people fail the CFA at the very end of January, and I don't have time to issue you a retest. So please get your things in um, before the actual deadline. Uh, Robert, no, you do not need to take both the SAT and the ACT, but if you do, send us all of your scores. Uh, so Carolina, great question about how is West Point different from the other service academies? Um, so if you are struggling between, do I want to be in the Air Force? Do I want to be in the Navy? Do I want to be in the Army? I would encourage you to look past the academies because while each academy has a slightly different flavor, we have a lot of similarities as well. Everybody requires the CFA. Everybody wears a uniform to class. Everybody takes um, a lot of math and science classes. Now, West Point, we do offer more liberal arts majors than the other academies. They are more STEM focused. But I would encourage you to look at what is the Army? What is the Air Force? What is the Navy? What is service in those branches all about to help you decide between the three service academies? West Point, we're all about leadership. Air Force, they like planes. I don't really like planes that much. Um, and I don't want to be on a submarine. I do not want to be on a submarine. Submarines are not my style. I do know how to swim. I'm not really big on the water. So Navy just was never something that I really wanted to do. So if you want to be in the Air Force, if you want to fly jets, if you want to be on an aircraft carrier or on a submarine, like more power to you, you go do that. We need great leaders in all of the services. OK, but you're not going to get to a sub coming to West Point. Uh, so Colby, you can apply for either state because um, you see you said your parents are in different states. Totally cool. You can apply in either state. You just can't apply in both. So you need to choose which state you would like to apply from and then apply for both the congressional and both senators from that state and then also the vice presidential. Uh, there's not. So Tian, I see you have a question about the emphasis on foreign language skills. There's not really an emphasis on that within the admissions process, um, but that is a good thing that makes you a well-rounded candidate through the application. Um, I did not want to. There we go. Malik has a, a CFA as the Dodmer. No, the CFA and the Dodmer are completely separate. So the candidate fitness assessment is a six event test um, that has pull ups or flex arm hang for the ladies, although we do encourage you to do pull ups. Um, you've got push ups. You've got a basketball throw. You've got um, modified sit-ups, 
a shuttle run, and a one mile run. And we've got all of this information and videos and videos of what we are looking for on our website. The, you can find the instructions out there um, for all the service academies. And then I think that many of us have now videos up as well as to exactly what we're looking for with this candidate fitness assessment. Then you've got the medical, which are going to be your exams. I'm going to go one slide further to medical. Okay, so medical is going to be very similar for the different academies. Um, you'll go through the base Dodd-Murb exams. So if Air Force releases you in August, but West Point doesn't release you until November, you don't have to redo all of those exams, okay? We're gonna pull in your exams from Dodd-Murb once they've been completed. We just have different criteria that would make you ultimately qualified or disqualified once it comes to a waiver process. So um, like Navy and Coast Guard specifically really uh, emphasize your red blind um, red green colorblindness, and you might not get qualified for them depending on what your eyesight is. Whereas for West Point, I just need you to be able to read a map under a red light. Okay, so our um, criteria for what is going to make you qualified can sometimes be a little bit different, but the base exams are going to be the same. If we think that you're a competitive candidate and you come back as disqualified, we're going to put your file forward for me uh, further medical evaluation and possibly a waiver. And then our doctors will review and decide whether or not you are eligible for a waiver. That is not up to me. As I was telling my last group, I don't have any medical training, okay? I have limited, limited medical training, just field medical training from the Army here at West Point, and then a little bit in the actual Army past that. I cannot evaluate your file to tell you whether or not you're going to get a waiver. Let's see. Um, so, Darwin, you say, will being accepted to SLE give you an advantage when it comes to West Point? Not in your application, but maybe in your decision-making process. So it's not like, oh, you went to SLE, so you get a couple extra points um, for that. That's not how our application process works. But what SLE could do is be like, oh, so that's what West Point is really about. That's what the Army is actually about. And it could help you um, solidify or decide against West Point as a place that you want to be. So that's how SLE will help you. Uh, it's not going to help your actual application. It just might help your decision-making process. Um, and then, Darwin, you've got another question about being an Army engineer. You can branch whatever. You can branch all branches from West Point, okay? You're not going to have, um, like, certain people. Like, you have to go mechanical engineering to be branched engineer. So if you want to be about, or if you want to learn about being an Army engineer, I would encourage you to talk to your field force and maybe they can link you up with an actual engineer officer for what they do in the Army. I'm gonna give a pause here for Micah. Micah, how are we looking on time? We're we're on track here. We've got time for probably uh, maybe two or three more questions. Awesome, thank you. Okay, Karen, I see you have a, a candidate or a question about um, submitting in October if you can't get an interview with a congressperson until December. So the nomination piece is going to be completely separate from your West Point application. So you will apply through your congressional representative and your senators for the nomination, and they will have their own interviews. They will have their own criteria. And then the West Point application is separate from that. Now, yes, you do have to get a nomination to be eligible to come to West Point, but the getting of the nomination piece is separate from the West Point application piece. Um, and then... Karen, again, a question about the explaining the difference um, among the services. You know, I don't think I've ever really seen a website that will compare and contrast the services for you. Um, I would just say research each branch individually and the possibilities of the types of things that you might like to do within that branch to help you make that decision. Uh, Rowan, a question, are you required to take a language? Yes, I took Russian. No, I don't remember any Russian. Not, not even a little bit, it's been 10 years probably 12 or 13 years since I actually took a Russian class. Um, so you will take language at West Point. How much you remember of that 10 years later, it's gonna be up to you. Um, and then if you wanted to be recruited, do you simultaneously follow the same application instructions? Yes, yes, you will go through the same process as everybody else. You'll just have a different admissions officer. Um, and if you are interested in trying to be recruited, go to goarmywestpoint.com and contact the coaches that way. I'm not gonna link you up with the coaches. I don't know the coaches. I don't know how to get in contact with them. Getting linked up and getting recruited by the coaches is entirely up to you as a candidate. 
Uh, and then is SLE virtual this year, Rowan? Yes, SLE is going to be virtual this year. Most of the, um, uh, hmm, most of the acceptances have already gone out or the offers, that's the word I wanted. Most of the offers for SLE have already gone out. We're gonna have a few more come out this next week and everyone will be notified one way or the other whether they were selected or not by the end of April. So check your spam folder. Um, and then just check your regular email and you will get notification one way or the other if you were selected for SLE. Uh, Karen, no, a bilingual, uh, a bilingual student uh, will not normally be exempt from a language requirement. Um, you'll probably be put into Arabic or Portuguese or something like that um, instead of one of the, the regular languages. I really want a German. I got Russian. It's, you take uh, an exam to see your aptitude for learning a language, and then they will assign you one on that within um, your top couple. Uh, I think I am running out of time, and we have to throw you guys out into the lounge. Uh, Micah, is that correct? Yes. We, we could probably sneak in one more question, uh, but I know folks may have uh, additional questions that we can't get to in this session. There will be it, as Major Rogers mentioned, there's a lounge area following this session that folks can go to and the presenters will be able to take questions at that point. Uh, and then Claire, I will answer your question. SLE is a summer leader experience. So if you are not a junior right now, um, if you are a sophomore or lower, 15 January of your junior year, you can open up your West Point candidate questionnaire and start to apply for the summer leader experience. So again, please check us out on our Facebook page and on our just West Point general admissions page. We've got a lot of great information out there and we've got a full brief of this that answers questions on our Facebook page, um, West Point Admissions Facebook. So please check us out and I hope to talk to you guys again soon. Thanks. Hi everybody. Uh, welcome to the breakout session on the US Naval Academy. Um, my name is Caroline Wadhams. I work for Senator Warner and we're delighted to have Second Lieutenant Austin Kyung with us from the U.S. Naval Academy. He's going to give a short presentation and then there will be an opportunity for Q&A when he finishes. Over to you, Second Lieutenant. All right, awesome, good morning. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see it? All right, so morning, Second Lieutenant Kyung. Uh, Naval Academy 2020 grad. Uh, I was in third company, and this is your Naval Academy missions brief. So who are we? So Naval Academy sits on Annapolis, Maryland. We're the premier officer of sessions uh, institution for the United States Navy and Marine Corps. We boast a eight to one staff to faculty, student to faculty ratio. We boast a 90% graduation rate. So that's for one of the highest in the nation. There's no tuition. For the Naval Academy, your tuition is part of the National Defense Authorization Act signed by Congress every year. There's a guaranteed post-graduation employment by becoming a commissioned officer in the Navy and Marine Corps. And we offer 26 academic majors. This PowerPoint needs to be updated. There was one major that was uh, recently added. So the Naval Academy campus is known as the Yard. Again, located in Annapolis, Maryland. It's 25 miles to Baltimore and Washington, D.C. The brigade services and facilities in Bancroft Hall, which is the largest dormitory in the world, uh, includes a barbershop, a shipment store, laundry, a completely separate USPS branch, medical, dental, and optometry services, the Michipman Development Center, and 22 world-class athletic facilities. Excuse me. The student body is known as the Brigade of Michipman. Michipman hail from all 50 states, territories, and allied foreign countries. So it's a very diverse uh, cultural heritage that they have. Also, sailors and Marines who, who are pride enlisted in the Fleet Marine Force also show up to the Naval Academy. Every midshipman is a leader, scholar, and an athlete. The Brigade of Midshipmen is approximately 70% male and 30% female. Fluctuates depending on the uh, class size and class year, but approximately 70% male, 30% female for a total force of 4,400 plus Brigade of Midshipmen. So in terms of education benefits, pay in your career, it's an undergraduate and commission program in the United States Navy and Marine Corps. If you graduate from the Naval Academy, you will receive a commission from for the United States Navy or Marine Corps. So for your college, 
Uh, we don't do gap years or anything like that. That's just not a thing. You do four years and you're required to do four years. You graduate with a Bachelor of Science. We offer 26 majors. There's also a very rigorous core curriculum and you have various internship opportunities just because we're close to Washington, D.C. and a lot of the three letter, three letter agencies that, that they're just physically located in Washington, D.C. Benefits, you receive a full scholarship. You pay zero dollars to go to the Naval Academy. Again, Uncle Sam pays for tuition, room and board, your food, medical and dental coverage. You'll be issued laptops, books, anything you need. You can show up to I-Day with a t-shirt and jeans and you'll do just fine. In terms of pay, midshipmen receive approximately $1,100 every month and pay increases each year. $125 to $600 a month. So as a freshman, you'll receive about $100 and each year it will just go up. In terms of career, you'll have summer training exposure in the Fleet Marine Force or you'll be assigned to a ship or a submarine in the in the Fleet Marine Force. And then you'll just shadow be part of that ship for uh, a month. After, you will commission as a, again, as an officer in the United States Navy and Marine Corps. There's a minimum five-year service commitment for naval aviators, so pilots and naval flight officers. That increases to eight years from your winging. Community pathways include surface warfare officers, so that's ships, naval aviation, naval special warfare, so that's Navy SEALs and explosive ordnance disposal, submarines, Marine Corps, cyber, cryptologic warfare. You can also be a doctor out of the Marine Corps. The Naval Academy boasts a 96% acceptance rate 96% acceptance rate to medical schools throughout the country. I had a class of 17. Uh, uh, she was accepted to Harvard Medical and she did just fine. Naval intelligence and naval oceanography. So we offer 26 majors divided into three categories, engineering and weapons, mathematics and science, humanities and social sciences. The two new ones added is data science just because of how important data science is to the rising threats of cyber warfare in the next coming decades and the second one that was recently added is foreign area studies so you'll be able to focus on a particular area in the region of the world and you'll be able to study just that area of the world and it will prove to be very beneficial in your career united states navy and marine corps you can also major in Chinese and Arabic. Again, Chinese and Arabic are the two most important ones. As we shift our national security towards the Indo-Pacific region, Chinese will be a key, key uh, major. There's also available uh, language minors, such as Spanish, Russian, Japanese, German, French, Chinese, and Arabic. Again, all these language minors are key DOD uh, languages. Athletics. Naval Academy competes at the NCAA Division I level. We have 33 Division I level sports. We offer the most amount of sports in the country, second only to Ohio State. We also have club teams, which for all intents and purposes of, of our Division I, one of them being the women's softball team, which won nationals back to back to back many times a year. If you're not part of varsity sports or club sports, you'll be part of intramurals and you'll be playing against your fellow midshipmen. And there are 11 teams and they're all co-ed. So we offer primarily two STEM programs. The first one is STEM, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. It's exposing rising high school freshmen, sophomore, and juniors to the possibility of a STEM career. And they're taught by professors and midshipmen at Naval Academy facilities. It's six days in June and tuition is $900 with financial aid. Naval Academy is, is, the second one is the Naval Academy Summer Seminar. It's for rising high school seniors to experience life as a midshipman. Again, there's some rumor out there that you have to attend Summer Seminar to go to the Naval Academy. This is not true. I never went to Summer Seminar and I graduated from the Naval Academy just fine. Uh, about 2,500 rising high school seniors attend one well, of the three-day sessions in June. Due to recent uh, environments and COVID, Vice Admiral Buck decided to have summer seminar be three-day virtual sessions. Both STEM and Naval Academy summer seminar, there is a tuition, but financial aid is available for both tuition and travel on a case-by-case -case basis. 
So again, check us out at Naval Academy Missions at NavySports.com. If you're looking to get recruited, please look up your uh, respective coach for your sport. And that's the end. Thank you so much. Um, there's now an opportunity for you to ask a question into the in the Q&A chat box, which is on the right of your screen. Um, I have a couple of questions to start um, that have come in. Um, the first is um, how COVID or the pandemic has changed anything. Can folks still visit the academies? So at this time, we're only offering campus tours to candidates who already have been accepted to the academy. But as the vaccine rollout becomes better, we expect that to change. And by year 2022, should be just regular. And has any, and also another question related to the pandemic, have any of the criteria changed um, because of restrictions on some of the extracurricular activities um, in terms of the application process? Uh, again, the admissions office, the admissions office is well aware of the restraints of COVID, and there's actually a specific uh, COVID section that says, how has COVID-19 impacted your activities? And the admissions board takes that into account when they're making their decisions. Uh, I've got a question from Jordan in the chat box asking um, Second Lieutenant Kyung, why did you want to go to the Naval Academy? Uh, Naval Academy was my life goal since eighth grade. I always wanted to be a Marine officer, and this this is the best way to become a Marine officer. So, shut up. Uh, another question. What type of leadership skills does the Naval Academy look for in a student? Uh, in terms of leadership skills, 91% of our appointees have played some kind of varsity sport. So, we're looking for... Uh, sports allows you to be part of a team and allows you to practice and allows you to compete in a live uh, environment with consequences. And so those just those are the type of uh, leadership positions that you'll be put in as a junior officer in the Fleet Marine Force. So that's one way to do it. Also, be a community leader in your church, in your high school uh, club, whatever. We're looking for good leadership uh, experience and that well-rounded potential. Um, another question. Could you describe a day in the life of a cadet or of a midshipman? Yeah. Sure. So in the day of life of a midshipman, so I'll just, uh, let's just do a plebe because everybody talks about plebe years. So plebes, you wake up at 0500 for your physical training with your training staff. That's about an hour. You come back around 6.30, uh, you, you shower, shave, put your uniform on, and you do your chow calls and morning course formations at 7. You go down to King Hall. Uh, meal ends around 7.30. You come back up to your room, clean up your room, 7.45. You, you report to your first class. Class starts at 7.55. From 7.55 to 11.45, you have class. And you come back to Bancroft Hall. And from 12 to 1.30, so it's at 12, there's new meal formation outside with a band, DMB, whatever. After that, you go to lunch, and around 12.30, lunch ends, and between 12.30 and uh, 1.20, that's training time, or if not, you seek out your professors, do EI, whatever you need to do. And then from 1.30 to 3.30, that is fifth and sixth period for your classes. And then from 3.45 to approximately 5.30 to six is your sports period. Yeah. Depends on your sport. I've seen some sports go until 6.37. Uh, from 7 to 11.30 is your mandatory study period, and then you go to sleep around 12, and you start all over again at 5 a.m. Excellent. Another question from Heather. Does participating in the Navy Sea Cadet Corps help your eligibility for acceptance? It's not a decisive factor, but if you, if you have key leadership positions within the Navy Sea Cadet Corps, yes. Another question. What is your favorite part of the academy? My favorite part of the academy, probably like a lot of graduates, Army Navy game. Uh, it's one of those things where, yes, the West Point cadets on the other side of the field, they're your enemy per se, but not really. I mean, those West Point guys, at some point, we will meet them on the battlefield. So we're on Team America, but just for one day. There are enemies. So, I mean, you're on national TV. The president shows up. It, it's, it's awesome. 
a question from Laura. Are all commissions upon graduation active duty, and how do you determine whether it's uh, whether it's Navy or Marine Corps? So the Office of Personal Management sets the requirement for Marine Corps officers to be 25% of all graduating class to be Marine Corps officers. So you complete a training known as Leatherneck between your junior and senior year, and that determines your 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 eligibility to become a Marine Corps officer. And yes, all commissions are active duty. And if um, a, if a candidate is not a varsity sports player, can he or she still become a competitive applicant? Yes, uh, you just have to pass the CFA with flying colors. Um, otherwise, as long as you have good, if you're part of student government, if you're president of a of a good club, uh, like a uh, few on top of my head, model, excuse me, model MUN is a good one. National Honor Society is a good one. Uh, you must show good leadership potential. Um, a more specific question is being red or green color deficient and automatic disqualifier for the Naval Academy? Not necessarily. I think I had a classmate who actually signed a contract saying that they can only commission Marine ground or restricted line, but those are medical questions that I'm not really comfortable answering at this time. How much does, from Easton, how much does taking JROTC in high school help an applicant compared to someone who didn't do that in high school? JROTC, if your JROTC unit is a honor unit or honor unit with distinction that opens up another nomination source for you, uh, otherwise, you must have key leadership positions within your JROTC battalion. If you don't, it's not really a decisive factor. In a question from Colby. Can you describe briefly how you became a, a naval aviator? So a naval aviator, uh, so if, if you want to be a naval aviator uh, as a midshipman, it's good to show interest as service assignment comes along. There's Naval Aviation Selection Boards, Marine Corps Boards, et cetera. As a plebe and as a youngster, just join uh, clubs related to Naval Aviation. The key, key point is probably your grades. Flight school, I've had classmates who are in flight school currently tell me that they, they study harder as a student Naval Aviator than they did as a midshipman. So being top 50% the upper half of the Naval Academy class is probably pretty important. Uh, otherwise, interacting with uh, Naval Aviators shows the Naval Aviator board that you, you are interested. Um, and if you're selected, once you, after you commission, you go down to sunny, sunny Pensacola and have a good time sometimes. Otherwise, you're studying. But. And another question related to becoming a pilot is how many people at the Naval Academy actually become pilots from Georgia? Uh, uh, depends on the year, approximately 20 to 25 to 30 percent. Okay. From Tion, is there really a subdraft for midshipmen, even if they don't want to serve on a submarine? There is a subdraft. There, uh, it's not necessarily a subdraft. Again, depends on the class. For the class, for my class, class of 2020, there were a lot of uh, There were a lot of submariners enough to wait. They they, did, they didn't need a subdraft, but there were a lot of swole drafts. So again, depends on the class. Class of 17 had a pilot draft, believe it or not. Class of 18 had a subdraft. Class of 19 had a subdraft. For our class, we had a so slow draft. So it just depends. And I think, and then there's one more question. Does your class rank affect your chances to get accepted into the piloting program? I think you've answered that. Do you want to add Thank anything you. else there? Um, not particularly. Again, academics is what matters the most because it's a key indicator whether you'll succeed in flight school or not. And another question from Chloe about other leadership positions that might stand out. Um, could you describe any others besides captains? Uh, you, you referenced some. Any others? Uh, student government. Let's see, student government, uh, NHS president, a model UN president. If for some reason your family's not as financially well off as somebody else, if you have a part time job after high school, the admissions board uh, also takes that into consideration. Uh, if you're a swimming instructor, you need to show some kind of tangible leadership opportunity. Uh, if you're president of your school's chess club, 
not really important. But if you're president of, uh, let's just say your school's Travis Mannion brand, which is a veteran, uh, a veteran a support group, that's more tangible. And a question from Sierra on the med, on med school. Um, could you discuss that that potential for med school and acceptance into the medical corps? Yes. So there is no official medical track per se at the Naval Academy, but there is a unofficial one. So usually you don't have to select chemistry, but you usually select chemistry as your major just because a lot of the pre-med courses you have to take uh, is in the chemistry major. Uh, I've seen mechanical engineering majors get accepted into the medical school program, but you'll have to take your mechanical engineering major classes plus your pre-med uh, courses. So that's that's a lot. You're looking at 23, 24 credits every semester. Um, but there is there's a chemistry professor here that specifically helps with midshipmen who have the potential to get accepted to medical school. OK, we're we're coming up to the end of our time, but just two quick things. Did, was there anything in particular you did to ensure your acceptance into the Naval Academy from Dane? And can you give a sense of what is considered a good SAT or ACT score? Thank you. For a good uh, standardized test score, you should probably shoot for around 700. There is no magic formula per se because every state, every nomination source is different. But again, top you at the minimum, top 20% of your class show good leadership experience. Uh, again, if you're not physically fit, we will not accept you. So, so that's a wrap. Thank you so much, um, Second Lieutenant. Austin Kyung for uh, for your answers. And if folks still do have more questions, there will be an opportunity later in the lounge. But thanks so much for your interest and take care, everybody.